Welcome to Backpacker Radio, presented by The Trek. I'm your co-host, Zach Badger Davis. Sitting to my right is... Hi, I'm Juliana Chauncey, a.k.a. Chauncey. Question of the day. This is another one from you. You're yes. just on a hot streak right now. Um, yeah. This. I'll give the question, and then you can give the context. Yeah. Have cell phones ever appeared in your dreams? Okay, so this one actually fits for today, because I have, as of last night, contradicted my initial thoughts on this. Um, there was a tweet posted on like a different you know how they make tweets reels on instagram and it's just like a picture of the tweet because i don't actually go on twitter so how i would have seen this tweet doesn't make sense to me i don't think there are reels on wait on twitter or like they'll take a screenshot of a twitter tweet and they'll put it on instagram as a reel so like this image on our show notes i saw that on instagram okay but that wasn't posted on instagram because you can't post like that got it on instagram anyway semantics um So the tweet said, how is it 2023 and nobody's come up with a satisfying explanation as to why cell phones never show up in our dreams if we're using them for 12 hours a day? Which prompts the question of the day, have cell phones ever appeared in your dreams? It's funny, yes, but since you've sent this. So I'm guessing it's probably happened before and I just haven't noticed because I haven't looked at it. But um, two nights ago, and I know this happened because very rarely does a dream affect me to the point where like, the lines of reality have gotten blurred where they infect my real life. I have to actually fact check something. Here's the story. So I had a dream that I came upon Sierra, my dog, and she was like all cut up from some, from me neglecting her. I think this is like, (laughs) this is is guilt for me, probably not giving her as much attention with all the kids in my life. Um, And I needed to get her to an urgent care. And I whip out my cell phone to find out where the closest urgent care is to map my way there. And like, as I'm pushing the buttons, it's not reacting and it's pushing the wrong buttons. Sort of the same anxiety provoking feeling that like when you're trying to run away from somebody in a dream and you can't run, Mm -hmm. I was getting that in cell phone typing form. I get that with trying to yell and not being able to yell. Sure, that's another class of I'm incapable of yelling in dreams. And I woke up so distraught that the first thing I did was go on my phone and Google the closest urgent care, just so I knew the next time if something happened to Sierra, I wouldn't have to rely <laughs> on my phone and I could get her there pronto. But it really fucked with me. So yes, yeah, cell phones do appear in my dreams and apparently I'm a bad dog owner now. See, it's funny that this was on today is because up until this morning, I would have said no. I could not recall them being in my dreams, but had I known this was today's, I might not have clued you in on my dream last night which you had a nice little haha about in our text thread. Oh, right. Um, so I'll tell our guest. So last night I had a dream that I was on my phone. Like this is one of those like real time dreams where you're at the time of like where you're at in life, just minus the part where you're already asleep. Mm. Um, so this was yesterday and I was on my phone yesterday um, and I was scrolling through Instagram and trail correspondence uh, had an episode post on my feed and the trail correspondence like logo, like the show art, was like a grayscale, black and white, like scribbles on a page type thing. Huh. Just like didn't look good. And somehow it was conveyed to my knowledge, like I don't know how I gained this knowledge, but somehow my knowledge included the information that Zach had made the executive decision to change the trail correspondence cover art to that. Um, to quote unquote get back to the roots of the show like he was like just like he made this call um, he wanted to like like cut all the like color and like trim all the like excess yada yada and just like go back to the core mm, what does it say about Zach? I don't know <laughs> what does it say about me that this school. is what I'm dreaming like I don't have affiliations <laughs> to trail correspondence you just think he's so old that it used to yeah, black and yeah the colors <laughs> leaving his body I think his decision making is crap <laughs> um, so then I showed up to the podcast today and I had the obstacle of like knowing that this was a really garbage decision and having to find a way to be like do I just stay in my lane and say this doesn't involve me and like not say anything thing or do i like put the integrity of that show first and find a way to gently let him know that it's an awful decision Mm. um so i sent that to our group chat this morning still in like a day of monday where you're not fully here and zach sent back oh we actually did change it to black and white over the weekend (laughs) and i was like no you didn't me an idiot rushing to trail correspondence page to make sure i didn't just convey reality as if it were a dream and Zach sends this photo, which, oh to be honest, is pretty similar <laughs> to, to pretty pretty fast that he sent it, and also pretty similar to the scribbly version my dream made up. So now I'm on trail correspondence, like stories. They had a story posted today, like watching the stories. I'm looking at their tagged <laughs> photos and checking everything because I'm like, I can't talk myself out of this. Like I just 
did this in the least gentle way possible. Um, so I'm glad yeah. that I had you going for a little bit. That was too easy to not <laughs> I, I mean, follow up on that. Monday mornings. I'm not all here. Yeah. And yeah, I was terrified for a moment there. Shout out. It's very easy to desaturate photos on Photoshop. <laughs> yeah. Just one click. <laughs> I mean, I did say I will not believe you didn't just do this. Yeah. But then you told me that you did. And somehow I am still questioning my own reality. No. Is <laughs> the other message I sent. So I guess I guess cell phones do appear in dreams. Yeah. I wonder if that's just one of those things where it's such a minute detail that you wouldn't remember cell phones in your dreams until you have the thought that they don't exist. I just like I could dream anything. I could dream I'm flying. I could dream I'm getting rich. I could right. dream I'm out on trail. Why would I dream about that? About your phone? No, about you changing the trail correspondence oh, right. mm. show yeah. art to be in grayscale. We should get a dream interpreter on the show and just yeah. explain why we're so fucked up. <laughs> That's a really good <laughs> idea. <laughs> uh, reminders of any kind? Actually, yes. Yep. Do I introduce this or do we nope. just go straight into a phone we're call? We're just going to discover this all together. Okay. Um, do you need a phone? I just need a phone number. Yeah, I won't say that one out loud. Yeah. Can you uh, fill the airtime while I'm doing this? Um, yeah. So we both checked our calendars today and neither of us had any knowledge of what we're about to try to confirm or deny. Um, so we're now trying to confirm or deny what we are unsure of. You do the talking. Okay. Because I don't know what to say. <laughs> I'm going to say a high probability this is Should we just start singing? Answered. Yeah. Okay. Oh, come on. Call her again. Yeah, we just got to keep That's going. That's not rapid, do it again. is it? No. Well, no, different way. Oh, She's a sweet, yeah. sweet Rachel. Um, she does the show notes and general organization you of know our rabbit? lives. I do. That's good. Good people. We had a moment. Yeah. <laughs> That's a story for all <laughs> A good moment. Yeah. Maybe she's going to think she's fired because you're just calling her on repeat. Should you start off with firing her? <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more time. Yeah, one more. <laughs> How many times do we have to do this before we give up? I'd say three is the charm. Okay. Do we have Alex's number? I don't. Hmm. Maybe I do. I remember if somebody one calls time you on, three times, you have to answer, right? Well, so, one time on Elise's birthday, we had to call Josh. No, I don't have Alex's number. She's probably like an important work function right now. Or it actually is her birthday and she's like out to a birthday dinner. Mm. Do we leave a voicemail? Nah. Or do we just fire nah, her? Because then she'll okay. just get scared if we don't. So okay. it's not. Well, now the story's not funny at all. Yeah. Well, Rachel put in our reminders of any kind. Happy birthday to Rachel. May she never be truly fired. Tee hee hee. Yeah. So we're not sure if she's implying that her birthday is on the day that this comes out or today that we're recording this. But either way, we're bad people for not knowing the answer. I checked both my written and my digital camera. Camera. <laughs> calendar. <laughs> it's Monday. I cannot. Yeah. My digital and my written calendar. And I don't have it written on either. Do you have the birthday under the date of release here? I don't have. Oh, I don't know. Check her Facebook. That tells you people's birthdays. We, we, we found out Elisa's age through Facebook the other day. No, it's not on. I was about to say, ironically, that's the day that this episode comes out. Duh. <laughs> 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 so dumb. I like that you volunteered that one. You you are Mondaying pretty good. I'm Mondaying so bad. I'm not Facebook friends I with Rachel. I didn't know what Shit. day of the week today was until you said it was Monday. Um, yeah, there it is. I don't think I am either. This will be a cliffhanger. I don't know how to spell her last name. Yeah. We'll get the answer by the end of the episode. So today's reminder of any kind is a true bust, but we're going to leave it in the podcast because that's how we roll here. At today's Backpack reminder, Radio. it might be Rachel's birthday. Yeah. And we don't know Baby. what day it is. As <laughs> we're saying this or as you're hearing it, those are two very different things, but that's neither here nor there. Let's get to our interview. We have yeah. an awesome guest in studio. Very stoked about it. We've been trying to get her on for a long time. Glad the stars finally aligned. It is Alina Abstract. Druv oh please help me here. Druvovka. Druvovka. <laughs> Druvovka. I'm gonna need 
fuck yeah, uh, who is a Colombian American illustrator, painter, and through hiker. Abstract has hiked the AT Israel National Trail, Pacific Crest Trail, and since 2020 has been creating mixed media trail themed art, including stickers, prints, paintings, and apparel. Abstract, thank you so much for joining us here at Backpacker Radio. Happy to be here. Yeah, this is great. Um, let's start off with the requisite question your trail resume. Oof. Well, you kind of just gave it. Yeah, I did. But I've hiked the Appalachian Trail one and a half times. I've hiked 1,900 miles of the Pacific Crest Trail and about half of the Israel National Trail, as well as working as a backpacking guide and hiking all over. Give us the one and a half AT hike story. Mm. Well, so I took a semester off of college to hike the Appalachian Trail. It was my childhood dream since I was 13 years old. And about halfway, I got bone contusions in my knees, unfortunately, and was forced off trail due to that. Is that a reoccurring injury or is that something that you'd experienced for the first time? First time. So I was pushing really big miles since I was trying to get back to school in time, had a whole tramly dynamic going on, um, and was also carrying a lot of weight. So Mm. just too much on my body, but I went back and was very intentional about doing lower mileage and was able to successfully complete it in 2017. What are bone contusions? Because I picture it as your bones are sticking out of your skin. (laughs) It it was not that horrifying. (laughs) Um, It's like micro tears that will eventually lead to fracturing if I had continued. And I was actually about to get back on trail. My mom works in healthcare and she's like, you need an MRI before you go back. Because I went and saw like a knee doctor and he was like, yeah, you're fine. Just wear this knee brace. And my mom was like, no, I really want you to get an MRI. And then the MRI is what showed that I was not Mm -hmm. fine and probably would have created some pretty serious damage if I had continued. So mom saved the day? Mom saved the day, as she does. Yeah, as they do. Um, so how long is the recovery from that sort of an injury? Um, there was no like, technical time frame, but I just got off trail and was taking the elevator here and there for a bit. But yeah, when I went back to the trail in 2017, so that was 2015 that I first attempted it, um, I didn't know... Um, if I would be able to do the trail or if that would be a recurring injury. And of Mm. course, when I went back in 2017, I injured myself on day two um, by spraining my ankle very badly. But I hiked on it and all was fine. Did you take time off? I took a few days off. I was at a motel um, behind McDonald's just by myself for several days and it was getting expensive. I was like, you know what, fuck it, I'm gonna go back. Um, I'd also met a love interest the day prior and is this the same as the current? The, the same as oh, the current. Oh, destiny. Yeah, destiny. That fate wanted you to get your ankle all fucked yeah, up. Yeah, he texted me back, said going slow, winky face. So I had some encouragement to get back and just took it slow. And every time I tried to catch him and do a couple extra miles, I would re-sprain my ankle. Mm. But eventually caught up to him in Hiawassee. So I was going to ask how you go from getting something like the first injury and saying better play it cool and get off trail mm-hmm. so it doesn't get worse to getting something like the second injury and being like fuck it let's keep hiking on it and <laughs> so the key there is love the key there is love slash stubbornness i think the stubbornness was as much i mean it wasn't love yet because we had just met we was met it? day negative one at a hostel that took us to the trail to amicalola falls But love was part of it, but it was also like, this was my dream since I was 13. So I was just so inspired to get back out and do it. And I had read online that you can walk with a sprained ankle. Mm. Um, Was it love at first sight for you? And can you walk us through the courting phases? Chance loves love. We're on, but we started this topic, so we're going to be be here for the next 45 minutes. (laughs) Welcome to your interview. I don't know if I believe in love at first sight, but definitely like at first sight. So it was at the (laughs) hostel in Dahlonega, Georgia, the hiker hostel um, that takes you to Springer, Amicalola. And yeah, there was definitely some interest, but I was keeping my options open slash did not want to meet love at that point. At that point in my life, I wanted to be single for five years. Hmm. And of course, when you want to be single for five years, you meet someone right. on day negative one of the yeah. Appalachian Trail. And then when you're desperate for love, you don't find it at yeah, all. Yeah, so exactly. You did the exact wrong thing. I did the exact wrong thing, but yeah, not love at first sight. And he was really playing it cool at first. He didn't sit with me at breakfast in the morning. So I was getting a lot of mixed Just signals. staring at you yeah, in you the You noticed corner. though, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. I, it's like he was giving me the vibes he was into me. But then when he didn't sit with me at breakfast, that really messed with me. So I like to ask this question because we get a lot of questions from people asking us how to non-creepily let mm. someone know they're into them on trail. Mm-hmm. What were the vibes he was giving that mm. you were picking up? 
Just very interested. I mean, he was the first one to catch up to me on the Amicalola steps, and we started talking. We had a lot in common. He's also Jewish, and he had traveled in South America, so I'm half Jewish, half Colombian. So there was a lot of common interest. And then, yeah, we just started hiking together immediately. And then that night, it was really cold and in Georgia in March, and I was freezing, like doing push-ups to stay warm, and he was still sleeping like six feet away from me in a shelter. So he was really playing it coy for a while, hmm. so much so that I was getting frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what is this? And like the following day, there was some trail magic, and he set up his tent like right next to me. I started doing all these tequila shots, because I was like, yeah, I might get a little wild. And he was still playing it coy, even in Hiawassee, so. So you gotta play a little hard to get. Yeah, you gotta play hard to get. And he says like retroactively, that that was he didn't want to come across too strong or creepily but he played that out the like not wanting to be creepy for so long that I started to get confused so where does it reach like a breaking point of you being like come on and him being like I'm cool guy Mm. well so after Hiawassee we started hiking together we passed the North Carolina border and then that night he put his arm around me at a fire and I'm like all right tonight's the night we're gonna hang out it'll be a kiss and then he went back to his tent, and I was still confused. He's a gentleman. He's a gentleman. But so when yeah. did first kiss happen? Oof. <laughs> see, there was a lot of, like, shelter sexual tension and, like, see, this is, see, you got a little uh, margarita in me. I'm like, oh, this story is He's not PG. There's actually roofies in there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's the greatest interview tactic. <laughs> I mean, there's not. <laughs> but, yeah, I, honestly, the kissing came later because kissing actually makes a lot of noise in a shelter. So there was more like some so just like hand jobs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how just much petting, it heavy just, petting, just some like light petting and some shelters and hostels. Actually, so much so that at the hostel in Franklin, North Carolina, that one of the guys staying there said he wasn't going to stay another night because of us. So what? that's all I'll say. But I don't remember where the exact first kiss was. But I would say that other things came before the first kiss because of the weird dynamics of the trail. So you were just sense. like not pre-kiss handing each other in <laughs> shelters. I wasn't <laughs> handing him. That's all I'll say. He was handing you though. <laughs> he, was, he was handing out jobs. <laughs> he was handing out jobs in the shelters. <laughs> I wouldn't even say that far. Maybe some light hair pulling. You know, it was very. <laughs> Very gradual. We were definitely were friends first. And since we're already just like getting deep into all of it, it was actually very hard to find condoms for a long time on trail. So at the NOC, a common resupply spot, we could not find condoms. So we really, you know, had a gradual relationship and friendship first. Yeah, there's that convenience store right there. I'm shocked. No condoms. That That's wild. Yeah. Is that because of the South factor? Like hmm. I don't know. But I think it was for the best. I would say the origins of our relationship was definitely like friendship first. Would you trust a condom in a hiker box? No. <laughs> would you? <laughs> no. I, I wouldn't trust much in a hiker box. I mean, last time on the Appalachian Trail, I took, like, couscous from the, uh, the hiker box. It ended up having, like, laundry scent when I made it. And then I was out a meal, so... And then you haven't been able to eat couscous since. I know, I still eat couscous. <laughs> okay. But I'm more discerning in my hiker box picks. Yeah. I think I could use a hiker box condom. You, you invested, could? Yeah. Well, because you're not the one that's going to... Yeah, you know, you're, you're not on the losing Plastic end if someone guy. pokes some holes Plastic in there guy. for fun. <laughs> That'd be pretty fucked up. I guess that doesn't exist. Things though. happen. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, that was a spicy start. Yeah, we just, that was spicy. <laughs> Where do we was go that from too here? spicy? Am I going to regret that? We'll <laughs> no, see. that was great. <laughs> Backpacker radio is Latin for regret. Um, <laughs> so you mentioned half Colombian, half Jewish. Yeah. That's an interesting combination. Have you met anyone else uh, aside from like maybe your immediate family that fits that description? <laughs> um, well, the only other person in my family that fits that description is my brother. Hmm. But I guess that makes sense. Yes. I've met other Latino Jews, but not specifically Colombian Jewish mix. So my first boyfriend when I was 13, he was Puerto Rican Jew. And everyone was like, we were the only Hispanic kids at that school. And they're like, oh, you two have to date. And we did. And <laughs> it, it was fun for a bit. But yeah. Did you feel a pressure to date him because of that or it just worked out that way? I mean, I think both, honestly. Yeah. But it also, like, I think it's it's a natural thing to be attracted to people like yourself. Sure. And so sense. our moms were talking in Spanish. And then, you know, I went to his bar mitzvah. Yeah. But he did dance with his ex-girlfriend first. So that was, that was mm. a big deal at the time. I do regret I was off the online dating scene before J-Date made its appearance. Mm. 
and I don't know. I just Would you have dabbled? For sure, yeah. But I you're not Jewish. I am Jewish. Wait, you, how I'm, did I not know that? I technically, the ginger. Technically, I am Jewish because it's your mom's side. Oh, it side, is your mom's side, yes. Only, yeah, my mom is wow. Jewish. Yeah. I love that I'm <laughs> outing you. He's only half. <laughs> I mean, that counts. I didn't know you were a fellow tribe member. That changes everything. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't have any, like, the cultural things. He hates I've Christmas. S- I mean, I, I wasn't bought mitts for anything. I didn't grow up with any religion aspect. Well, I dropped out of Hebrew school right mm. away. What's Hebrew school like? I mean, I only went to a couple classes, but, you know, uh, a lot of songs, singing around a guitar, teaching you about God, and I was very, like, athe- atheist from an early age. Mm. Do you celebrate any of the Jewish holidays, or do you still carry on the atheist tendencies? Um, my family's a lot of Jewish atheists yeah. um, on my mom's side, and then my dad's side. We used to go to Columbia every year for Christmas. But we do, yeah, we do Hanukkah and some of the some of the traditional stuff, but with our own twist. So like every Thanksgiving, we do Hanukkah immediately after Thanksgiving, since that's just convenient when the family's all there. We do all eight nights mm. in one night. But yeah, so we still keep some of that alive, but no one's very religious. Yeah. That's an interesting thing about Judaism is like it's religion and also culture. Like yeah. you can have one without the other. And I think that probably applies to my family as well. Yeah, I see it more as an ethnicity, which maybe is controversial. But like I see it, it's like, yeah, I'm Jewish and I'm Colombian, not from a religious standpoint. Mm-hmm. But to me, it's the same thing. Yeah. All right. So I want to go back to the uh, <laughs> love interest on the Oh, A-T. yeah. That's, that's where the juicy story is. Yeah. <laughs> How did that blossom along the trail? And so that was 2017. So you guys have been together for six years yeah, now? Yeah, good math. Yeah. Good math. Over six years. Um, yeah. So I guess what's what was the blossoming of the relationship on trail? Like, when did it go from like a... This is a sexual fling to <laughs> now we are boyfriend girlfriend. <laughs> Oh, boy. Yeah, I mean, there wasn't really a defined moment where we're boyfriend, girlfriend. But, yeah, we were hiking together. Obviously, you get to know people very quickly on trail. I'm trying to remember when it, like, really shifted. I think it was the Smoky Mountains is what changed everything. Because after Fontana Dam, I started having some second thoughts. So I was like, for me, I always didn't want my through hike, which was a childhood dream, to be defined by a man. Especially since you don't know if it's going to work out. Yeah. And so once we got to Fontana, after that, I was like, I'm actually going to get on at a different point, especially since I already hiked the southern half of the trail prior. I was like, I'll miss a mile, give myself some space, think this through. Um, but my partner, he's a very fast hiker, so he caught up for me very quickly. I was very unsure. And then a blizzard hit the Smokies, um, full on whiteout blizzard. And he moved into my tent mm. during that. And that's when everything really changed. Yeah. You also mentioned that you had the dream of through hiking from the age of 13 years old. Yeah. Where did that stem from? So I used to go to like a normal summer camp, a YMCA camp in New Jersey, and they had an optional two week trip on the Appalachian Trail and canoeing down the Delaware. So that was my first exposure to backpacking. And yeah, I met some female through hikers who were just like filtering some water by a water spigot. And I was like, oh, like, where are you coming from? And they're like, Georgia. And I'm like, wait, what? And they explained the whole concept of through hiking the Appalachian Trail, which I had grown up in a city, like no outdoorsy people in my family. And I was like, wait, like as a woman, I can just like go out and live in the woods for six months. And at that time, like as I was discovering backpacking, it was super cathartic for me at that age. And so that just planted the seed, and I became obsessed, read every book about through hiking and the Appalachian Trail. And so, yeah, that's why it was important to me that that journey wasn't defined by a man. And even though I met my partner on the trail, um, I still did the second half solo since he had actually flip-flopped and had already done the northern half, Mm. which was actually a big reason I even considered dating on the trail was because I knew that he wouldn't be there after Harper's Ferry. Sure. Do you think you guys would have lasted if he wasn't flipping? Oh, if we were just going no bow? Yeah. Yeah, probably. Because as soon as he wasn't around, I was like, damn, my pack's heavier. This isn't as fun. Yeah. So probably, yeah. But would you have realized that if he wasn't not around? Mm, I mean, who who knows? Um, okay, so you never define the relationship. There was a moment leaving Bob Peoples when we were, like, slack packing that I feel like we had a moment. But it's so long ago now. It wasn't, like, a defined thing, no. But after the Appalachian Trail, we just, like lived with each other ever since Hmm. what was it like retracing your steps in what was it 17 and 15 yeah and in two years after uh you had gotten injured 
are you anxious to get past the point where you'd gotten off mm. or is it like reminiscent to be on the trail that you'd already hiked what what is that feeling like? yeah it was definitely nostalgic and reminiscent and cool to know where certain things were and certain places i wanted to stop even with the trail magic so like on day two, it, I had started the trail the second time at a very similar time frame as when I had started it initially. And so I knew when the trail magic would be. And I had intentionally packed very light for my first resupply because mm. I knew at Gooch Gap they do the St. Patty's party every year. And yeah, I was right. It was there again because otherwise I would have had way too little food. But yeah, it was Wait, fun. Tell me more about the St. Patty's party. Oh, yeah. that's a wild party. Yeah. So they refer to themselves as trail devils, not trail angels. Oh. So they party hard. Um, There's a guy named Beer Man, B Man, and yeah, he had like a younger lover, and they were like having a trail baby. It was like very wild. And Miss Janet was there at one point, and Tambourine, if you know of who all these characters are. I know Miss Janet. Tambourine sounds familiar. She makes how some. Far in, how far in is Gooch Gap? It's very. It's like the second day. We should do that as a winter road trip. We Just should go. Show up to the we should start the AT. At Amicalola, yeah. do the stairs again, and then finish at Huge Gap mm. at St. Patrick's Day. So we could start at my birthday. Just show up with Irish. Oh, I guess you can't say that anymore. Uh, <laughs> what's the PC term for the drink with the Guinness and the whiskey and the, or not the know. Bailey's? You can't say car bombs anymore? I don't think you can say that. Really? I think you're in trouble. When did that happen? <laughs> you're canceled. Uh, yeah. you know that? I think that is just a very negative connotation. When did they I think it's like calling they, a drink call like the, the drink 9-11 now? or something. I can see how that would be bad, but yeah. what what do they now call that drink? That's what I'm asking. I don't know the answer to that mm. question. Google might know. Yeah. But you should go. Yeah, it was a fun party. Um, they got a lot of hot dogs, a lot of beer. That's actually where I first heard Less Gear, More Beer, which is one of my sticker designs, which is funny because someone tried to out me for like stealing that logo from something. I'm like, this has been part of like the trail idiom forever. Like no one owns Less Gear, More Beer. Right. Um... I remember I wanted to make the tagline for Trail Correspondence talking about walking, and then mm. I realized there was another popular podcast that I talked that heard use that as their tagline. Mm. There's some of these things that are just so low hanging fruit. Like yeah. you have to assume that they've been taken. Mm. Or not taken is the wrong word because I agree with you. I don't think you can own that unless you know you trademark it. Um, but yeah, I agree. I used to looking up the yes ICB. <laughs> um, it says you shouldn't even order it anymore. <laughs> yeah, I th you can still order it, but I think you have to like wink. Be like the Irish drink, mm. the one that tastes like chocolate milk and is great. I feel like the wink makes it worse. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're being racist through your body language. Oh, so now some people are calling it an Irish slammer. So this is racist cool. towards Irish people? Well, because so. they used to have car bombs like in a anti-religious mm. type of way. I could, like, it definitely makes sense. The... Um, this I've is never a, heard of any of this. Yeah, this the is cocktail's name refers to a decades long. Well, the car bombing isn't fairly recent, but the the realization that it might not be good mm. is the cocktail's name refers to a decades long period of violence in Northern Ireland. The tensions mm. are deeply rooted in the history of Ireland and its colonization by Great Britain starting in the late tw 12th century. Centuries of conflict later, and the island was divided into the Independent Republic of Ireland and the British ruled Northern Ireland beyond the differences in government. The two territories were largely divided over religious lines. Um, and these conflicts came to a head in 1968 and were followed by a period known by many as the Troubles. The next mm. 30 years were filled with violence, um, with the paramilitary group IRA regularly using car bombs as weapons. Mm. Oh, wow. um, one day in 1972, known as Bloody Friday, involved the detonation of over 20 car bombs in Belfast. So yeah, very problematic. I can I can yeah, very much really see that. Yeah, I'm really seeing why this is problematic. Um, yeah. So in today's edition of getting canceled, <laughs> I think they're now calling it the either Irish Slammer. I like that. It this drink good. may appear on menus as the Dublin Drop, the Irish Shot, and the Irish Slammer. Yeah. Those all sound better. Whatever it is, that is the best of the dropping mechanism drinks. Okay. Well, Let's now we learn something <laughs> and everyone who listens learns something. Yeah. Um, so the Judaism is on your mother's yeah. side. Uh, does your mom also fit the Jewish stereotype of being like a very nervous Nancy? Oh yeah. Yeah. So. I had on the Appalachian Trail an AT and T phone, a Verizon phone, and a personal <laughs> location. <laughs> and when I had my pack shakedown at Neil's Gap, like I was like, "What the fuck is this?" And yeah. I was like, "You know, this is how the only way my mom sleeps at night." So I did carry all of that. Were there times where the AT and T was superior to the Verizon? 
Um, yeah, back and forth. It just depended. But oh, really? Verizon was superior overall, I believe. Yeah. But yeah, my mom made me um, check in via personal location beacon every single night on the trail. And it would suck because at times it'd be like super rainy and I'd be out there trying to find like mm-hmm. the clear sky. But yeah, she fits that stereotype to a T. Yeah. I remember I ran into that issue on the PCT in the Sierra because I would just set it to tracking mode. Like mm-hmm. I didn't do anything manually thinking that it was updating my pin to my family, primarily my mom. <laughs> And uh, apparently in the entire stretch of the Sierra, it wasn't delivering the, mm. the lo- my location. So my mom had a panic attack. So <laughs> those things can definitely backfire because oh, if you're not prepared for them to have technical malfunctions, uh, heart attacks can mm. ensue. Yeah. So what was it like managing your mom's fear? And I assume it must have been better on the second go around. Mm, no, because on the first <laughs> go around, I had started with my ex-boyfriend. So she at least had that. On the second go uh, around, I just flew down to Georgia, $50 one-way ticket, was completely starting on my own. Um, but yeah, it was hard. Even when I met my partner on the trail, actually, like I thought it was a hoax. Like somewhat jokingly, I thought like my mom had set this up, hired some guy <laughs> to meet me, some cute Jewish guy <laughs> to carry my tent. And so that that was an ongoing joke. Wait, that would be really funny. Yeah. How do you know he's not? I don't know. <laughs> if there's a mom out there that's trying to do this, get in touch with us. We will help facilitate the plan. Yeah. If it was any mom, it would be mine. Yeah, she's very paranoid so much so that actually when i had planned my own little backpacking trip when i was 16 on the trail my mom called the atc because she was super nervous and the woman at the atc actually said the only thing that your daughter has to worry about is you because she was being so overprotective <laughs> damn yeah how did she <laughs> take that the cold hard truth um not so well but <laughs> i don't know she got used to it and i think she takes a lot of pride in it retroactively Probably specifically because now it's connected to my career. She's like, yeah, I was supportive all the time. I was like, "Mm, you thought I was just going to be like barefoot and pregnant at some commune. Let's be honest. But yeah, that was an alternate life path of mine. Do you think she was buying out all the condoms in the stores just ahead of you on trail? (laughs) Oh, no, she's not like my family's very sex positive. My grandma's a sex and marriage counselor. So I come from a long line. Your grandma is? My grandma is. She actually wrote a book about sex, love and marriage. Whoa. Um, What's the name of the book? um, Wizzy Wisdom. So we call my grandma was it? Yeah, Wizzy Wisdom about sex, love, and marriage. I believe is the title. I am on the cover. (laughs) Fifteen-year-old me with my grandma. Well, so the first edition. There's two. There's two volumes. The first volume is my grandma with her three grandkids, and the second volume is her naked in a bathtub. And that was my idea, but with bubbles. So look it up. And you're in that cover. I'm not in the second one with the bubbles and naked grandma. Yeah. If so, I'm gonna I'm gonna find a picture of your grandma naked on the internet when I search this. Yes, you can. I've made a painting of it. Yeah. What is the inspiration to include your grandkids in a book about sex? Well, so I think the idea is that it's like grandmother's wisdom. So it says wuzzy wisdom, I think parentheses, grandmother's wisdom uh-huh. about love, sex, and marriage. So you're, she's passing down her values yes, to you guys. Yes, exactly. Got it. So but, what what are some of the cornerstones of the book? Like what what's a takeaway? I, I understand sex positivity mm. in general, but like if I were going to read this book, like what's one of the key things I'm walking away with? Well, her life philosophy is drink wine, dance, and fuck it. And she means the Damn. fuck it part both literally. Wizzy sounds fucking awesome. Yeah, Wizzy, Wizzy's the shit. Hell yeah. Wait, she this is a fantastic party. Did cover. you find it? Did yeah. you find the bathtub one? Amazon has the wholesome <laughs> one, but I do like the bathtub one yeah. best. She's also drinking some wine in that. Yeah. I don't know if you saw that. That's amazing. Yeah, she's a good time. Wizzy wisdom. Damn, it sounds like you come from a fun... I bet those family reunions are a riot. Oh, yeah. she. So she came and visited when I was in college and took my friends out to dinner, and she started asking them all if they were orgasmic and just... <laughs> yeah, not your average grandma. Yeah. Where do you go from there? Where do you go from there, yeah. I, I, I grew up with some shit, because my mom has written books about sex as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, so maybe... Is he a Jewish side? Is he the Jewish side? Apparently, side. very sex positive, but she's a marriage therapist, so it's slightly Same different thing. angle. Wait, but so is my grandma. Oh, really? Yeah, she was a marriage counselor yeah. for most of her career. Wow. Apparently, uh, I don't, I'm trying to think of a Jewish fruit doesn't fall far from the <laughs> Jewish tree. But. <laughs> yeah, my upbringing was not like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what was that like? I want to hear about it. Your mom uh, and her sex books. It was, I mean, so the, the most popular book about sex was probably the sex, she wrote both the sex-starved marriage and the sex-starved <laughs> wife. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and she went on Oprah for this book. So it wasn't wow. like she slid under the radar with these things. Like all my friends knew about it. They'd like to poke fun at me, which really got to me in middle school. And now mm. it, I, I ended up working for my mom for a long time post college. So obviously I uh, grew to adopt it. But a sex starved wife, that's quite a title. Yeah. Was that an uh, autobiography? Not an autobiography. <laughs> that'd be, like, that'd be much more dad? embarrassing. If I, my dad can't get a bonus. <laughs> no, uh, it, through her work as a marriage therapist, okay. she encountered the common instance where, you know, the. Uh, there's this perception that the man is the sex hungrier person, mm. but I forget the percentage, but in a lot of instances, it's actually the woman. Oh, interesting. And she wrote a book illuminating that. And yeah, basically she's just got a lot of advice to uh, try to get the sexual urge back in people's dusty marriages. Wow. Which so. now with three kids, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like my grandma and your mom need to hang out. For sure. I, mean, I would maybe. That'll be a panel I'll come to. Maybe yeah. that should be the podcast. Maybe Michelle and Lucy already know each other. <laughs> that Let's put Rachel, little note on this let's do an outreach to do the sex panel with zach's mom and abstract's grandma i feel like i should be opposed to this but i'm actually down let's i do feel it. like it's a good idea yeah, this is a fantastic <laughs> idea especially for me down i yeah. know her she's down is she colorado based no she's in philly slash florida okay i actually had her answer um anonymous questions in my instagram story before but then all of her responses started with the solution being to first drink wine and then someone <laughs> reached out and was like i'm sober like all of the advice is centered around drinking and yeah. i'm like yeah this, this is just what my you. grandmom says yeah. like, well now it makes sense why at the trail magic you were pounding tequila shots <laughs> well so <laughs> i'm actually not a big drinker personally <laughs> contrary to this margarita right in front of me yeah. but I'm a bit more of a safety meeting kind of gal. Uh, right, right. Whew, this is a fun start. I Damn. know. This is a, I this thought we were going to talk about hiking. Fun. We're talking about sex and also more sex. <laughs> yeah. Um, sex sells. Yeah. AT, retracing your steps. Um, yeah, so you, what was it like to get past the point where you had gotten off trail the first time? Mm. Yeah, that was really great. And my partner, since he finished in Harper's Ferry, he actually came back and slack packed me all of Pennsylvania. Mm. So that was really great. Um, but yeah, honestly, the time alone. Was there any part of you, because you went into this with the mission of not being reliant <laughs> on a guy, and now he's slack packing you through Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. was there any part of you that was like having double feelings about this? Um, maybe in moments, but then when you're like eating a Chipotle burrito bowl after a 20 mile day in a like lounging movie theater, I'm like, no, this is pretty great. Yeah. And, and we were caring. able to do a lot of trail magic. And so at the beginning of every day, anyone that was around me were like, all right, I'm going 15 to 20 miles, like throw your pack in yeah and so yeah we did a lot of trail magic he also ended up yellow blazing a lot of people which was funny because like i'm not into that no judgment maybe a little judgment but <laughs> it was just funny how many people like who knew him from the trail community would just be like after i left and was hiking like hey do you mind just like driving me 20 miles up the trail and yeah. like he would but yeah. then he would tell me about it yeah um oh i just had something to say and then i lost it oh i found it again um talking about like things that are kind of nice <laughs> when they shouldn't be. Um, tip for any of the men listeners, male listeners, or maybe not even the male listeners, anyone that's trying to non creepily like catch someone's attention, nothing beats someone else offering to fill your water. That's great that you mentioned that. Because the first that. night on we, the Appalachian Trail when we camped together, I filtered his water. as That was my flirting technique. Uh -huh. And then I never did it again. And when I was at that mo motel behind McDonald's recovering from the ankle injury, I wrote this whole blog about ways to flirt on the trail that weren't creepy. And I was going to submit it to be a Trek writer. Mm. And then I read in the fine print how then it couldn't be submitted on other channels. And I was like, fuck it. Uh -oh. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> when we commission something, we uh, do exclusivity. But So I'm curious I get it. But what are some of the tips? Uh, that's a good one. I got to pull up the article. But yeah. yeah, filtering the water. Really just like assisting in these small ways that aren't creepy. So caring things, filtering things. Yeah. Cooking something, a hot drink. Surprise snack. Yes. If Mims, if Mims was trying to woo me, her sneaking out cookies for my birthday <laughs> on the trail would have absolutely done it. Didn't she? I thought she snuck out the like, cake or something. What Ooh. was it? They were well. They were they were funfetti frosting cookies. Ooh. Right, right, right. So yeah, my partner Lyle, he did have banana bread on the first night. Uh -huh. So that did because I wanted to go further. So he stopped after eight miles, and I wanted to do sixteen miles. But I was also trying to be mindful that I just started. I'd gotten injured before, and he convinced me to stop after eight miles, partially due to banana bread. <laughs> I would say like compare it in your mind to like domesticating a raccoon. <laughs> 
like they like little snacks mm-hmm. um you know getting water for them yeah. like perhaps a shelter that they might not have previously Bear hang. right go hang that for me very common yes. overlaps I'm glad you made that analogy, not me, because I don't think that would have landed <laughs> quite as well. <laughs> um, there's so many different directions to go. I want to know about the, what's the story behind the Wonder Woman outfit? Mm. I honestly, that was just like the one Halloween costume I had. And I so thought, did you summon on Halloween? No, I didn't. I just randomly <laughs> thought it would be fun to have my mom ship that to me, which is funny because that's like before I was into social media or any of that. And now it's just like, I feel like a very iconic photo. So I'm happy yeah. I did it, but I was just being extra. I remember because we do like the uh, Katahdin photos every year. Yeah. And I remember that one standing. There's always a few photos every mm. year because like there's only so much you can do in a Katahdin photo to stand out. Like obviously it's one of the most impactful moments of your yeah. life. At least that's true for me. But it's the people that like have some level of creativity that stand out. I remember your photo. Um, I remember there's one dude who submitted a photo in black and white, him standing atop the sign with like a totally like just deadpan face holding a sign <laughs> that says roll credits. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually pretty good. Yeah. yeah. So that's what it takes. I feel like that sign was a little intimidating. Like it was bigger in person than you expect. And at 5'1", yeah, I was just scared to climb it. Did you not climb it? No, I did climb it. But like I was worried I'd fall off and the cliff was kind of like close-ish behind. Mm. So whenever people do cool things on like Mm. one of those, I'm always like it's... It's tall and scary in person, so good for you. Yeah. You're a nurse Jewish mom somewhere in you. Yes, right. Yeah. <laughs> but no, actually, now I'm remembering more that the story behind that also is when I moved to Colorado for college, I had this intention of hiking all the 14ers and wearing the Wonder Woman costume uh, on top of all of them, which I've only done a couple, so that never panned out. So yeah. I was like, all right. You I got, got Katahdin. Yeah, I got Katahdin. I got Pikes Peak and that, and that's about it. Nice. Did you go to see you? I went to Colorado College, Colorado, small where? hippie liberal arts school in Colorado Springs that has Springs. like a block plan, so you only do one class at a time. Ah, so that leads in perfectly. Obviously, people who are familiar with you already are very familiar with your art, which is incredible. We've got it here in the studio. Yeah, it's great to see an original here. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Shout out to uh, Christopher Marshburn. Thank you so much for commissioning that. Uh, were you arting along the way, or at what point did the cross section between your through hiking and art? start yeah so I always did um so in 2017 mainly when I was um alone I did paint a bit some like small watercolors actually it really started in Vermont where I had a pool of water in my tent and was just super bored and started using that pool of water in my tent as a way to paint with my watercolors so I did here and there but on the trail you're pretty exhausted so most of my art came out um, as a reflection of my hikes later when I was indoors. But I do love plain air painting and painting out in the trail. It's just complicated. Yeah. You have a very distinct style of yeah. art. Abstract is your trail name. <laughs> it, is there a story behind your trail name aside there from is. the obvious? So I used to make even more abstract art than my art is now. So like no forms. I also did a lot of nude art and actually <laughs> to lead into our conversation from before like more I guess you could even say sexual art mm. um, and a lot of self portraits um, but yeah that just like never really took off but I always painted I used to do a lot of landscapes on wood and would sell those when I was living in Bozeman so I've had lots of different artistic styles um, but it wasn't really until COVID that I went all in on the art mm. what's the logistics behind a uh, self nude art piece are you looking in the mirror do you have a photo of yourself how does that work both both it was actually funny because when i was living in philly and doing that style of art it was hard to find places that accepted like nude art because we are at times a puritanical society Mm -hmm. and so i found um a coffee shop in the neighborhood of philadelphia that was down for me to put all my nude paintings there and at the time i was dating online and had some tinder or jd i can't j swipe was actually the Mm. one the jewish tinder and was on that and some guy suggested that coffee shop and i just didn't say anything but meanwhile like my boobs were just all over the walls Hmm. but yeah i want to make more nude art but we'll see yeah has the style always been relatively the same and i'll let you describe it because i'm not an art person in any stretch i'm (laughs) I'm bad at art chance is a pretty good artist but we won't talk about her because it's not her turn 
Um, but your style is very bright. Yes. I, I think abstract is fitting because it merges a lot of con different yes. uh, conceptual. Yes, and I didn't answer your question about the story because there is yeah. a story behind it. Yeah. Oh, but yes, yes I, so before the 18, 2017, I did always paint, but mainly like these large impressionistic watercolor paintings, some which were also had nude figures in it. Um, but yeah, the trail name really came from when I was on the trail in 2017. In the log books, I would do these blind contour drawings, which is a style of drawing where I just look at your face, but don't look at the paper. And it turns out quite abstract. Hmm. It's actually a point of controversy since my partner says that he gave me that name. But I actually remember this other guy giving me the name. But <laughs> Have you contacted the other guy? I haven't, but I should. Yeah. I should. His trail name is Ice Pack, so I should reach out to him. If he's yeah. listening, let me know. Do you have yeah. his phone number? I can call him right now. I can probably find him on Instagram. <laughs> I could only imagine what my art would turn out if I'm not looking at the actual paper. It would we be... have pens and paper here. I think that should be an activity yeah, sure. we, we do. We could do after. that. We'll, make we this we'll put it on the YouTube. Yeah, exactly. Here's a little <laughs> yeah. bait for the YouTube. Yeah. Uh, although I will say if I was looking at the paper, it wouldn't be much better. Um, we can do it in a circle. So I'll draw you. You'll draw mm. abstract and abstract will draw me. Like so I'll that. get the best one, yeah. obviously. We can, we can sell abstracts on eBay for like 10 grand at this I don't, point. I don't know about that. <laughs> we can each plop a foot on the table. We'll draw out of each other's feet. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, so you mentioned you got the or you got the trail name in 2017. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that you went 2015 without a trail name? No, or I had a trail name there what too. Was it? it was Swole. Swole. Slash my trail family called me Swole Lena since my name's Lena. Um, so the very first night, I'm always very cold, so I was doing all these push-ups to stay warm, and I had recently learned the word Swole. So I was like, yeah, you know, you gotta stay Swole. And then that stuck, even though I was not swole at all. Yeah. Are you saying swole, like S-W-O-L-E, or are you saying S-W-U-L-L? -L? No, the former. Wait, what's okay. the latter one? I don't know. That's just what it sounds like when I hear Do it. You, have you heard this? I know It's like a gym bro no, 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 term. I, I, I know swole, know yeah. Yeah, yeah, about. that the, one. The spelling of the second one that you mentioned, I don't That's know. That's just how my brain's hearing it when she says it. Oh, mm. yeah. So I want to make sure I'm picking up the right word. Yeah. No, I connected the dots, especially <laughs> when she mentioned the push-ups. That yes. made sense. Okay, well, I'm an idiot. Well... We but yeah, I wasn't a big fan of that <laughs> trail name, so I was happy to be given another one. An abstract is way too fitting. So yeah. do you, did you do any of your iconic paintings on the second AT hike? Like anything that we would recognize mm. or available on the website? Probably not, no. Most of them are like very small watercolors since I couldn't carry very much. Mm. And I guess that leads the question. So PCT 2019... Yeah, I don't want to skip. Not, oh, so we'll, we'll the, the Israel Trail was 2018. Yeah. So after the Appalachian Trail, my partner Lyle and I, we went and worked at a wine company in Toronto for a random brief period of time. And then we went to Israel to hike the Israel National Trail. Is he Canadian? No. How did you end up in Toronto? So my grandma actually has like a Are very... Are back to woozy again? It all gets back to woozy. <laughs> so she has a, a super small like one bedroom apartment there that she bought after 9-11 because she was worried that my brother was get drafted. Classic paranoid sure. Jewish grandma. Yeah, of course. So she bought our family a little safe haven in Toronto <laughs> that like no one was using and we were young and being dirtbags and trying to save as much money for the next trail. And we're like, yeah, we'll go to Toronto. And she had like this connection with this entrepreneur who had started this wine company there um so yeah that's how we ended up there for a bit of time while mm. we were planning the israel trail now give me the full deeds of the israel trail in terms of like the facts how long is mm. it where does it start where does it end how do you prep for it permits weather windows all the yeah. all the typical mumbo jumbo yeah, so it starts in a lot israel and it ends near the golan heights um, I cannot remember the mileage. You could probably look it up, but because it was in kilometers, so now it's all just a blur. Um, so the first, the section that we did was the Negev Desert that goes from a lot to like Arad, which is the Dead Sea area. Six hundred and twenty um, miles. Six hundred and twenty miles. Um, and I actually quit at the Dead Sea because I could not do it anymore. I was just pissed off. It was a really, really hard climb. Um, this mountain called Mount Carbolet. Um, and it was really tough because we had to carry all our own water. There's no natural water sources through the whole trail. And we had paid for some water caches and one of them had gotten stolen, which was why we ended up just carrying everything. And that was really trying. And it was also just very slow traversing. So there's a lot of like canyons with rebar and ladders. It was really, it was a really cool experience. Um, but I was just getting pretty fed up with the trail. There's not much shade during the day. Um, there weren't many other hikers out as we were expecting. And like, we love the trail community. So not having that was hard. 
Um, but it was a really cool experience, like archaeologically. So when we were in Timna National Park, we met we met a bunch of archaeologists from the United States that invited us on an archaeological dig at an old copper site dating back to like the time of King Solomon. And basically, we were just doing their bitch work, but we were happy to do it. And we found like all these like several thousand year old date seeds and like the chicken bones from the food that the people were eating up there and like goat hair knots that were still intact. So there were some really cool experiences there. Um, but ultimately, I just didn't feel inspired to keep going. And we had met a trail angel who had traveled all over the world who said that her favorite place she had ever visited was Romania. So I booked a flight to Romania mm. at the Dead Sea because I was just over it. And then, yeah, we went to Romania and Portugal and traveled all over those places for a bit. Damn. What's wild. it like with towns? Like, are mm. you are you passing towns frequently? How yeah. How long are your resupplies? So, yeah, that was another reason that I was just over it because to get into the towns was just like a hard hike and then when you got there there were a list of trail angels which was awesome um but a lot of them didn't speak english a lot of them were orthodox jews and so it was a little bit complicated since lyle and i are not married and Mm. navigating that and like most of them are kosher households they were like super hospitable like some of the most hospitable people we had ever met they would like tell us to resupply from their fridge and we're like we're not gonna do that but that's super kind so it it was a really interesting cultural experience and for me like when I graduated college, like, I really wanted to explore, like, the two parts of my identity, which is kind of how I ended up doing that. So I have, like, the Jewish side, and so that was kind of what led me to want to go back to Israel. I had gone there for birthright, if you know what that mm-hmm. is. And then after college, I had also lived in Colombia for several months. Um, but then when I went back to Israel for this whole trail, like, it was a cool experience. Um, but, yeah, it also, like, shone a light on, like, why I didn't want to move to Israel because there was a period of time where I considered like making Aliyah and moving there and doing that whole thing. Mm. What's making Aliyah? I probably don't know the tech. Have you heard this? No. Okay. It, it basically means like becoming a citizen of Israel. So they have programs that like help you like move there and like find employment. But I've always been an escapist since the through hiking thing. I was like, yeah, I'll move to Israel. Like they mm-hmm. subsidize that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it seemed like a cool adventure and Israeli men are really cute. So that was probably <laughs> a factor too. What was the birthright experience like? Because I, so I hiked through hiked 2011 when I was 26. Okay. And I, to my knowledge, that was the last year that I could have done the birthright. Mm. And the birthright thing had just been put on my radar just a few years prior. So I was basically picking between the AT oh, and wow. doing birthright. I picked the AT. So I want to know what the birthright experience was like. Well, they show you all the highlights. I mean, it's it's a, it was a fun time. Yeah. Like, learned a lot about, like, Israeli culture. And then they also have, like, Israeli soldiers that are the same age as you as part of the tour. So, yeah, it, it was a fun experience. And, like, yeah, it's a free international trip. But mm-hmm. obviously, that area is very complicated politically. And I'm not, like, pro-Israeli. It's complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, and Israel, you know, is going on birthright is controversial in and of itself. And why? that's why... I, why? Um, Because some people see it as, like, propaganda and trying to make people, like, make Aliyah um, and move there, which is why I also wanted to go back on my own terms. To that point, is there any truth in the fact that they get you drunk and are just pairing you up with attractive people Mm. your age trying to uh, keep the bloodlines? I mean, yeah, there's definitely some truth to that. Um, I wasn't into any of the soldiers on my trip. I did have, like, a slight love interest, um, but that, t- that didn't pan out. He started to, like, say if I didn't give him a kiss that he was going to, like, jump off some cliff. And it turned, really, da- it turned really dark really quick. Um, and when I was injured, actually, on the Appalachian Trail, like, many years after my birthright experience, he, like, randomly called me from that motel while I was healing my ankle. So that was, like, a weird serendipitous huh. moment from Israel because he ended up just staying in Israel after birthright. But, yeah, there is some truth to that. Yeah. Is that a tactic that ever works? <laughs> Threatening <laughs> did, your own suicide? It did not work on me. Yeah. That made me want to run the other way. Yeah, I think that's the rational reaction. When you're hiking the Israel National Trail, is it, like, do you feel safe on that trail? Like, what is the climate like when hiking? Because I know you mentioned there's not a lot of hikers around you. Yeah. For me, I think just hiking solo somewhere that's not, like, the continent I'm from mm-hmm. would be a little intimidating. Yeah, it was a little intimidating. I mean, most of the Israelis we met were super hospitable. But, yeah, a lot of sun, not much shade. Like, I have a photo of myself in, like, the, like, funniest little rock formation, which was, like, the only shade around. Um, So, yeah, it was just super intense. And, like, Israel's 
not super affordable so like resupplying was a bit hard like i ate a lot of hummus um they don't have all the fancy like backpacking meals like we have here oh yeah what kind of food did you eat a lot of hummus a lot of pita but I'm sure the hummus and pita was Yes, bomb. it was good. It yeah. was good. I got some, like, truffle oil spread. That was fancy. Mm. Um, but, yeah, pretty minimalist. Maybe some couscous. But not all, like, the fancy prepackaged stuff that you find here. Like, granola bars. Like, they don't have the same amount of stuff. Would you have felt more nervous if you didn't have Lyle with you? Oh, yeah. yeah. I would not have done. I would have quit on the first day uh-huh. if it wasn't having Lyle with me. Because, like, I'm scared of heights. And that trail really tested me in terms of heights. Because there's, like, all these, like, rebar ladders that go up super high. And just in general, the trail has a lot of, like, very sandy, steep drop-offs. Mm. You mentioned that you were expecting a lot of other hikers and there weren't. That wasn't the case. Did you run into other people doing the full trail at all a couple but maybe we didn't go in like the peak season so we were there in january which we thought made sense with like the heat but maybe the peak season was like february Hmm. do you have any advice for someone who has this trail on their radar i mean it's definitely a really cool trail and if you're not scared of heights and don't mind having a solitary somewhat solitary experience i think it's really interesting and if you like desert hiking it has just like awesome canyons to explore and like the level of like history and archaeology that you can find there is pretty unparalleled. You mentioned the exposure risk that made you uncomfortable. Is there any sort of like geopolitical? Mm. Like, are you in any areas that are unsafe from that standpoint? I mean, of course, my mom was scared about that. Yeah. Um, but no, I didn't I didn't feel that way at all. Okay. I mean, you see a lot of like military planes flying around pretty low, but I wasn't really worried about it from mm. that standpoint. Also, can I pee real quick? Yeah, of oh, course. Yeah. <laughs> Should we hit the pause button or just keep chatting? Whatever you want. We'll call Rachel Five, again. Four. Oh, yeah, let's call Rachel again. Five, just four, skip the three. two. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're going to get an answer to this question. Well, now she knows it's us calling. Yeah, we're going to get it. <coughs> I like that we still didn't tell her why we were calling. Yeah. She thought we were persistent telemarketers. If a telemarketer called me three times in a row, I'd probably throw my phone in the ocean, which is tough because I'm not close to an ocean, but I would travel to one and Fair. pitch it. Strong Hello? Arm. You're fired. No. <laughs> okay, so we, we see your note and we're both feeling like terrible people. Is today your birthday or is it the release day that's your birthday? Today. You don't have to feel bad. I don't know how you would have known that. <laughs> Three, two, one, go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Why do you say happy birthday weird? You say it so fast. Happy birthday, dear Rachel. You're fired. Happy birthday to you. How did we not know it was your birthday? It wasn't on either of my calendars. Why wasn't it? I don't know. How dare. The, the irony is you want immunity because it's your birthday. I think you're fired because it's your birthday and we're not aware of this. We also both realized we're not friends with you on Facebook, which prevented <laughs> our knowing. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was kind of thinking that I would answer and you'd say you're fired. I was expecting you to immediately hang up <laughs> right after that. <laughs> that sounds like something we What do. were your hypotheses for why we called before you now know why we called? Wait, I can't really hear you that well, Tom. It's okay. Try it again. I said, what hypotheses did you have for why we called? Bef- well, when I didn't know who was calling, I was like, this is aggressive spam. <laughs> like, they are really <laughs> persistent. Like, I swear I've ended this call like three times in a row. Um, but then, then I figured you saw my note after you said it was you calling. Yeah. See, th- I have Mara's birthday on my calendar, and that's my personal so calendar. So now Charles is just rubbing in the fact that she likes Mara more than uh, you. Invitation from Zach Davis. <laughs> it specifically says invitation from Zach Davis. So. <laughs> oh, now you're throwing me under the bus? Yeah. Thanks, John. All day repeats yearly. Okay, well, we're going to put so it So we need uh, to put a yearly We're going to put it on the calendar. <laughs> Uh, well, Rachel, happy birthday. Thank yes. you. <laughs> As a present, we will not fire you for today. Okay. Um, you, are, you are on the episode. I don't know if you put two and two oh, together. Oh, yeah. Do we have We're your permission recording. to include this recording on the podcast? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, that's fine. <laughs> okay, good. Do you we, have anything you want to say to your fans? Wait. Sorry. What is that? <laughs> Do you have anything you want to say to your fans that listen? Oh, um, oh, man. It's hard on the spot. Um, 
just like thank you to all my dedicated show notes readers out there like i love you so much and you're keeping me employed and that's great <laughs> our resident freak in the sheets and birthday gal rachel Yay. pierce story for rachel happy birthday uh thank we you. suck for not knowing that but um now you're on the podcast facebook no, friend request incoming yeah thank you okay Bye. Go eat some cake or drink some whiskey or something. <laughs> Bye. Okay, back to the interview. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, okay, we did the, we just did the Israel National Trail. Yeah. Let's talk about the PCT. Yeah. PCT 2019, you mentioned that you did 1,900 miles. Something like that. Yeah, so give us the rundown. So that was a tough snow year. So we hiked 700 miles, um, Nobo, and then we took some time off flipped up to Hearts Pass and went Sobo. And then my partner Lyle really wanted to go to Trail Days. So then we hitched to Trail Days and then we're like, shit, we're getting like close to September. We should like go do the Sierras before that's not an option. So then we flipped back down to the Sierras and did that section. And then it was just getting pretty late into the season. We completed the Sierra section and then it was like right before Truckee um, where I just wasn't having that much fun anymore. And there weren't many people out there. I woke up and my shoelaces were frozen every day and Lyle would go put them in the patch of sun and let them defrost while I was still sleeping. And yeah, we were just like really debating if it was worth keep going like deeper into fall slash winter. And then we got to this road and I was like feeling pretty over it. And then there was a sign there that said, keep going for whatever reason. And I took that sign as reverse psychology and I was like, I'm gonna not keep going. And <laughs> Fuck you, sign. I'll show you. <laughs> so I have a picture of me with the sign that says keep going, just doing like a thumbs down. And yeah, decided to get off there. There were some people there just going on a day hike. And I had enough service to look up flights from Reno. And eventually they gave us a hitch into Reno. And then we hitched to the airport. And I went home. Hmm. And we still want to finish it. But yeah, we'll see where life allows us to do that now that i have my own business it's just hard to get away as i used to i understand that yeah <laughs> so you did the at two years after you'd done the first half of it i assume part of that was like you were getting the itch to complete something that was only partially done so i d yeah so basically in 2015 i took that semester off of college when a lot of people were studying abroad i took all these extra adjunct classes which were free um so i could have that semester off and like at the time, my dad was like going through some health issues and like money was a bit tight for my family. So I was like, oh, like I'll just take a semester off and I can still graduate mostly on time. And then, yeah, so then I went back to college after I failed the AT. And yeah, then after college, I really had no idea what I was doing. I worked for Knowles for a bit, lived on an off-grid yurt in Idaho, went Whoa. to Columbia, lived in a eco village for a bit. And then I went back to Philly and was just like working some odd jobs and like pursuing the art thing. And then, yeah, I just randomly decided to buy that one way ticket back to Georgia after actually an art show where the guy I was seeing at the time didn't come to the show and I was all pissed and just wanted to get away. And I was like, okay, yeah, $50 one way ticket, why not? You mentioned that you wanted to explore both half yeah. of your roots. And you mentioned just now that you'd spent some time in Columbia. Mm -hmm. um, First, let us know what it was like living in Colombia. And I'm also curious to know what were the similarities between your time in Israel and mm. Colombia? I don't know if there were that many similarities because they're just like completely different, like ecosystems and the people are very different. Um, but yeah, it was cool since like my dad's one of seven. So I have a lot of and my dad's the only one in the U.S. So I have a ton of family there and a ton of cousins that I'd become alienated from. And I had actually wrote a grant when I was in college to go to Columbia and study art there since my dad's second cousin is a very famous artist there. Mm. And I'm not like in communication with him, but he's got like tons of art museums and sculptures there. So I wrote this grant and really reconnected my dad with his family. Like he has a twin sister that he hadn't been talking to for a long time. And so I reconnected with them all. And that's what really gave me that push of like wanting to go back and spend more time there. And then I used to also be very interested in communes and eco-villages, and I studied sociology in college. I ended up doing quantitative sociology, but I was always interested in communes, so. What is quantitative sociology? Yeah, so like, for example, my senior thesis was on digital inequality. So I was like running logistical regressions on census data hmm. um, and looking at how people use the internet, whether that's for information or entertainment. 
and controlling for different factors like economics and college degrees and seeing if there were still racial disparities between how people use the internet, which hmm. there were, which was interesting. But yeah, just using software to analyze data versus qualitative sociology is having focus groups, talking to people, um, a bit less numbery. Mm -hmm. What were the biggest um, racial disparities in terms of internet usage? I mean, all of them. So it was just like, it's hard to remember. I'd have to pull up my senior thesis, yeah. but it's on my LinkedIn if anyone wants to read it. Um, but yeah, just in every category, there were racial disparities in how people use the internet. Hmm. So yeah, I guess what were the biggest differences in your time in Israel versus Colombia? Mm. That's a good question. I mean, obviously really different food. The people are really different, but yeah, I guess I connected more with like the landscape actually of Colombia and I understand way more Spanish than Hebrew. So that was pretty different, but I really need to spend more time in both places. I would say I'm a bit more compelled to go back to Colombia just because it's such a bigger country than Israel. Israel's so small. So I have been to a lot of places there while Colombia, I still have a lot more places to explore. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is too early to segue to, but you mentioned now owning your own business. Yeah. And I want to know how you got from, like, going from doing art as a hobby and that progressing to finding finally a coffee shop that would put up um, <laughs> your sexy, nudie <laughs> paintings. Is that how you describe them? Sexy, nudie paintings? Sexy, nudie paintings. <laughs> um, to, like, turning it into, like, a full-scale business that has a lot of cool, like, things happening to it right now. Yeah, um, it's been a wild journey. So it really all came from the pandemic. So at the beginning of the pandemic, similar to my other stories, when I see a cheap one-way ticket, I go. So right before the pandemic, I saw a $75 one-way ticket to Costa Rica. Mm. And so my partner, Lyle, and I went to Costa Rica. Um, not much of a plan. We were going to be there for a few months. And then the pandemic came, and we were watching the news in the U.S., and it seemed really bad there. There weren't cases in Costa Rica, so we weren't, like, rushing to get home and then by the time our flight our return flight was coming it got canceled and everything kept getting canceled and we had to sign up for an embassy repatriation flight to even get home and during that time while we were waiting for that Costa Rica was taking the pandemic way more seriously than the United States so everything was closed all the beaches were closed even like at parks in a local town they'd have caution tape around every single bench so there was really nothing to do but we were stuck at a beautiful hot springs owned by some german guy that let us stay there for like 17 dollars a day and i had like a very small watercolor set and i just started painting and experimenting with painting like different little trail logo paintings and putting them on social media and reddit and they were actually doing really well on Reddit, which is what gave me the confidence to keep making these designs. And then, yeah, I just got so much positive feedback with social media that I kept going. And then by the time I came home to the US, um, both my jobs were no longer happening and people started commissioning paintings. So the first commission I got was a 15 person trail family. I charged mm. very little for it, but the fact that people were reaching out for that um, was giving me all the positive signals to keep doing it. And then, yeah, just kept building with social media to the point where I realized people were really into stickers. I mean, this is a really long story, so I'm trying to... That's why you're here. Yeah, that's why we're here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I put all my designs up on this website called Redbubble and noticed that a lot of people were ordering stickers of the designs because the designs could be put on anything, but people were ordering stickers and I was making like 20 cents per sale and I was doing a little happy dance. I was like, wow, I wonder what would happen if I just like ordered 100 stickers of my own inventory and see what happened. And I sold them all within 24 hours. And then I ordered another one of my designs of stickers, sold them all again. And so it just kept spiraling. And then like stores started reaching out if they would sell them. And then I start after the store started reaching out, that also gave me confidence. And then I started asking places like REI and just like bigger brands and just like having the audacity to ask for opportunities. And people generally said yes. How do you ask REI to be in their store? Because for me, someone who doesn't do that, um, like I feel like when I look at a store like REI, my like non-involved in that space brain goes like, well, you can't ask like the manager of the store. You know, like you'd have to find someone online, but who, like, who do you, how do you even mm. do that? You know? Well, that's what's funny. The first REI I was ever in is the Boulder REI. And I was living in Boulder at the time just for a few months. 
and I was in REI returning something, which is kind of funny. Um, but so I was just there at the cash register returning something and just was like, showed the guy at the register a picture of my art and was like, hey, like I make these designs. Like, like how do I go about like talking to a manager? And I assumed nothing would come of it. And then like a month later, the manager reached out and placed an order. The order was very small to start. Um, and then I had so many friends from all my time on trail that worked at REIs and they started just like pitching it to their bosses without even asking me hmm. and that panned out. So like the only REI that I'm in from like me asking is the Boulder REI and then I'm in two other REIs from people I just know from the trail who pitched it to their managers. And then the fourth REI was a connection through the entrepreneurship program I did with REI called Embark, but that was like later on. You're in the Denver one, though, right? No, not yet. I should go in there. I swear I saw your stickers in the Denver one. I want to be in all of them. That's the goal. Um, So that's in the two-year plan, but we'll see. Don't hold me to it. (laughs) You mentioned the Embark program. Tell us about that. So that's an entrepreneur program that REI puts on in collaboration with Founded Outdoors for underrepresented founders in the outdoor space. So I was part of their first cohort of founders. So that was, I believe, two years ago. So yeah, that was the first cohort to ever do it. And I was just at the Big Gear show with them and got to meet a bunch of the founders. So that was a pretty amazing opportunity to be connected with them and learn more about entrepreneurship since I was just making it up as I go until that. Yeah. With making it up as you go, talk to me about imposter syndrome. Mm. Have you gotten it? Oh, for sure. Like all the time, you know, like even to this day, I get that's like, oh, is my art even like that good? Or like, I didn't go to art school or like, can I really build this into like a legitimate business and like my livelihood? So, and honestly, each time someone commissions a painting, it's like pretty wild to like take their money with the confidence that I'm going to make something that's like worth several thousand dollars to them. So I still feel that, but then I eat an edible and hope it does. <laughs> I was not expecting that. The best advice to combat imposter syndrome you know, we've gotten. I'm going to be honest with you here since they got a couple margaritas. Well, just one margarita, but I have very low tolerance. It's like, honestly, a lot of opportunity came from me being a little bit stoned on my Instagram in a bathtub. It's like, yeah, let me slide in their DMs. I'll slide in their DMs. And it's funny because when I was in this Embark program, one of the women who's like head of merchandising at REI, I had slid into her LinkedIn DM super late one night when I was stoned and just feeling audacious. And it's like, oh, well, there she is. And like, now I know her. And so, yeah, sometimes you need that little extra courage. That's great advice. I um, I feel very fitting for an artist's journey as well. Like if there's not a substance involved, then I don't know. It feels wrong. Mm, I mean, there doesn't have to be. And I do paint something sober and I'm not always stoned by any means, especially if I'm dealing with numbers or money. I try to be very sober. And honestly, the initial vision of the painting, I am generally sober as well. But that's where the imposter syndrome comes in because it's like, yeah, I am a legitimate business owner with a business and like this is my livelihood but it's like to me I'm still like this like young girl stoned in her pajamas staying up all night painting like that's how I see myself did you take an edible before this no I didn't okay. that would be way too high risk that's more high risk <laughs> than alcohol not, not from our standpoint but <laughs> <laughs> from my standpoint uh, yeah that's fine um well I had read an article and I'm going to butcher the actual like facts of this article but the just was that there is this woman entrepreneur that was doing all kinds of stuff and she had like been sending all these emails and like outreaching and like coordinating with all these people as like an employee of hers named Tommy, but it was her the whole time. And I've definitely messed up some details of the story, but it was just her using a different name. And like, just so that she didn't have to feel like she was the one doing it Mm. and like the imposter syndrome. So she combated it by just being a different person working for her, representing her instead of just being her. I thought it was genius. I see that. Because, yeah, I could hyperanalyze an email forever. So I could see why that would take some of the stress out of it. Yeah. It's Tommy. Like, instead of me writing for me, I'm writing for someone employing me. That makes it so much mentally easier, I feel Mm. like. Was there an inflection point for you from going from, like, putting it on Reddit and getting a positive response to being like, oh shit, there's potential for me to do this as my full-time career. Mm. It kind of just snuck up on me and I just kept raising my prices and people still kept commissioning the art. 
Um, so yeah, it just kind of happened like over, it feels like overnight, but it was like this gradual organic thing. And then like once I realized that like the stickers was a way that I could really scale the business and that like through the pandemic, I painted so much and like I painted at a very low price point. So a lot of people did commission art. Um, I already have this like giant portfolio of designs that can be stickers. So right now I feel like I'm just freeloading off of my past self during the mm. pandemic who worked really hard. And now I'm just selling past Alina's art. How do you decide how frequently to put out something new from the past vault? And how do you decide how to price art? Hmm. I think pricing art, I, I really, I don't really know what I'm doing at all with it. It's just like people are paying this price. Let me increase it by a few hundred dollars and still see if they'll still pay for it. And at this point, I've priced it so high because I was starting to get like carpal tunnel. And I was like, mm. oh, I can't paint with the same frequency. And if I do, it needs to be really worth my while and be sustainable for me. And so I get a lot less commissions now, but that was also a way to incentivize myself to really sit down and focus on growing the B2B sticker wholesale channels, um, because that's what's gonna give me enough income to paint what I want again. So you're doing this very official business. Like you, you mentioned B2B, mm -hmm. doing a lot of wholesale yeah, I'm stuff. throwing out those entrepreneurial terms. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's <laughs> awesome. I love this. What have you, what's been the biggest challenge for you in starting and growing uh, this entrepreneurship mm. online business? I mean, obviously when I was just doing the painting side, I had all my old art supplies. Someone commissions a painting. It's just my time. I'm keeping all that money. But when I'm starting to wholesale to stores, it's like the whole issue of like economy of scale. So if I'm gonna, let's say REI orders 50 stickers of one design, it does not make sense for me to order from a manufacturer 50 stickers, because then the price point per sticker is gonna be quite high on such a low quantity order. So I have to order several hundred, if not a thousand of a sticker design to get a low enough price point that I'm gonna have good margins. And so that's what's hard is really investing in it, because like, I place sticker orders for like upwards of like six, seven thousand dollars at times. Mm. And that's like a lot of money to be investing in your own business. So at that point, you really have to believe in it to be sitting on all that inventory. Yeah. No, you're, I know that feeling. You're, but, you're butthole puckers when you put it in order, yeah. especially for something that you haven't sold in the past. You're like, is this going to sit in my closet for the rest of my <laughs> life or are people actually going to buy this? Yeah. That's what was really cool, actually, about the Embark program with REI is in addition to the knowledge and the network that they give you, they also gave me like a $10,000 grant. Mm. So it's like when I was preparing for Appalachian Trail Days um, last year, it was like, OK, like all that many money went straight to purchasing stickers. Do you have any sort of system for testing demand before putting it in order? Mm. Yeah, I mean, obviously, when like stores place an order, I get an idea of what designs they're ordering. Um, and going back to the days of when I just had my designs uploaded on Redbubble um, and they were handling all of it, I could see which designs were selling the best. Mm. So, for example, it's like I have this little Talenti jar design that says cold soaker. Like, that's so specific to the through hiking niche. Like, an REI is not going to be ordering that. So, I'm not going to be placing big orders for that. Yeah, sure. Now for the less glamorous side yeah. of making art. This is one of the first conversations we ever had. It was at Trail Days. I don't know if you remember it. but I, do. I don't remember how we got on this topic, but having your designs ripped off. Oh, yeah. That's that's a whole can of worms. So, yeah, that, that actually goes back to the REI program as well. So I was in this entrepreneurship program with them, and I was just doing some market research. So I went on Amazon, typed in hiking stickers. The very first thing to come up, Amazon's choice was a big sticker pack and two of the designs in that sticker pack were my stickers, one of which is actually a self-portrait of myself on the Pacific Crest Trail. And so my heart sunk. I was like, what the fuck? And then I just found seller after seller, all based in China, selling these sticker packs that were all stolen art, but with varying amounts of my own designs. And then I started looking on Etsy, on Alibaba, on eBay, and I was finding it everywhere. So the source was uh, Alibaba. And then you have all these sellers on eBay, on Etsy, drop shipping these sticker packs that contain my stolen art. Mm. And so I would send cease and desist letters to them. But it's an ongoing problem and just something at this point that I've just accepted as part of what it means to put your art out in the digital age. I, so you say sending cease and desist letters like nonchalantly for me <laughs> that seems like a huge like burdensome task oh it is H how do you go about like countering when someone takes your art like break that down for me and also how does that not burn you out 
I mean, it did. Like, I had a full breakdown, and Lyle, I'm going to stop saying my partner, Lyle, since now we're deep enough into it, but Lyle was like, you know, you just need to channel all your anger and frustration, like, into a reel or, like, an Instagram video and, like, tell people what's going on because the scale of it was so overwhelming. Like, at the time, it was, like, 50-plus sellers on all these different channels selling my art, and I did have, like, a full-on breakdown. But at this point, like... I just kind of expect it because every time it's like whack-a-mole every time I get it taken down on Amazon a new one pops up and at the end of the day it's going to be shit quality stickers they're super small and it sucks because Amazon doesn't care they make money off of it and so when I send a copyright infringement report to Amazon it will get taken down but in rare occurrences the seller then will appeal my cease and desist or my copyright and then that's when Amazon says, oh, you need to, like, get an international lawyer or something. And that's where it's like, okay, me as a small-scale artist, I am not investing the money in an international lawyer. Slash, even if all your designs are copyrighted or trademarked, it doesn't matter internationally. Like, China has completely different copyright laws than the U.S. So, mm. basically, I'm just shit out of luck, and I've accepted it. Um, but I'm hoping – and, you know, that gives me the motivation to just build my business up to the point – where I have enough recognition that people can see this as counterfeits. Um, but it sucks and is really discouraging and something that I still deal with. Can it, you, go ahead. There was a guy that I followed on Instagram that did like line art. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think his name was Sam Larson or something like that. And he had Forever 21 made a shirt with one of his oh, designs. Wow. And it turned into a big thing because he had gained a pretty big following by that point. And it was like, how can, how can companies just do this? You they know? have more resources and better warriors. So are you having to go through a process, like let's say you have a sticker in the vault of past Elena and then you want to pull it out of the vault. Is there a process that you go through before putting it anywhere on the internet now where you get it copyrighted or you do certain things to try to be preventative? You know, I should, but ultimately I don't think it matters because these copyright laws aren't international. So it only protects me so much, but it's on my infinite to-do list. And it's also expensive. Like if you want to get things traded marked like that's a very expensive process Mm -hmm. but I talked to the U.S. patent office when this was all happening since the REI program they had some connections there and they were like yeah every single state in America has a class action lawsuit against Amazon like so much of Amazon is counterfeits so much of the internet is selling counterfeits so yeah it's just part of doing business in the digital age yeah my knee-jerk reaction is like rally your community to leave one-star reviews for all these people. But to yeah. your point, there's so many of them, and they just keep popping up. Like you can't keep putting that no. ask out because it's it's a fire that's just going to continue to spread. Yeah, yeah, it sucks. I don't know what the solution is other than becoming either. like a billion-dollar business and having the legal team to fight that. Well, which... working on it one step <laughs> yeah. at a time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How do you bring yourself to keep? Because you said every time one goes away, you find a new one. Are you still proactively looking for them? Because I feel no. like I'd get to a point of defeat. Where I would just kind of turn the blinders on. No, I don't. It was actually after Appalachian Trail days. Luckily, like, I know enough people in the community and in the hiking community that, like, they'll tell me if they see something fishy. So, like, after Trail days, this guy who's also a trail angel, like, his friend had my sticker on her water bottle and he, like, asked her where she got it. And yeah, it turns out Amazon and, like, so things like that. Like, I've seen multiple of my own counterfeits in real life, which is pretty terrible um but at the end of the day my art's still getting out there so maybe <laughs> that means something yeah damn that sucks it makes me angry like i because the entrepreneur part of my brain is spinning like what can we do to fuck these people up but uh if it's if it just keeps happening and spreading i don't know i don't know what you do i don't know what i do either so yeah i don't actively search it out but if it gets brought to my attention i will report it on amazon but at the end of the day like if i let it consume me that's just going to take all my energy away from building my own business Hmm. so what is the inspiration nowadays for a new painting do are, are you working purely on a commission basis where someone's like here's a photo of XYZ, please paint this. Or do you ever have a moment where you're like, there's a beautiful sunset. Mm. I got a little bit of margarita in me. Let's (laughs) grab the canvas. More of the edible, more of the edible. Okay, sure, sure. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah, so I've paused. So once, so I'm currently on Outside's Get Outside, um, Get Outside tour. And so once I accepted that role, I've paused all my commission work. And I've also priced it, my commission so high that it's really made it so I have less commission work which is all by design so that I can force myself myself to focus on the b2b because if people want to hire me to paint it's so hard to say no to that because I do love painting Um, but the hope is now that I have some time on this tour when we go backpacking to focus more on just 
you know, being inspired out in nature and doing that because that's something that I really miss. And like with making any of your hobbies or passions commercial, it makes it harder to do the thing you love, especially if you're doing it for money for other people. Yeah. Okay. Outside tour. Is this the dream job of the century? (laughs) What is it? Yeah, so I'm on the Get Outside tour, which is a six-month tour. So it's under the umbrella of, like, Outside Inc., like, Outside Magazine. This was the last thing I was expecting to do with my life. So I was living in Massachusetts for the past year and a half while Lyle was finishing his degree and building in construction technology with a focus on sustainability. He got his first, like, corporate job. We were going to move to Greenville. He was going to negotiate that job. And we were finally going to be, like, stable, normal adults. Like, we want to have a family, all that kind of thing. And then the same day that he gets the corporate job offer, it's our six month, six year, sorry, six year anniversary. That evening, I get this mysterious email about this get outside tour. And they pitched it to me that I still have time to run my own business and whatnot and travel across the country um, for six months. And I immediately was like, oh, of course we can't do this. Like, you just got this good job offer. We're finally ready to be stable. And Lyle was like, Let's just take the call. And I had worked with Outside before, and he was under the impression that this would be an amazing opportunity for my business and symbiotics. So we take the call. There are some sea otters, river otters, playing on the lake where we were living at the time, which we had never seen before. Maybe an omen. I don't know if I believe in that. We had never seen them. They were, like, popping in and out of ice um, fishing holes. And, yeah, we took the call, and it did sound pretty dream jobby, especially since it would be van lifing, which is not something we would have ever done um, outside the job because having a custom-built van is quite expensive. And the tour was already going places like the Appalachian Trail Days where I was already going for my business. And, yeah, the mission of the tour is simply to just inspire people to get outside, which I think we can all get behind. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, definitely dream job. Of course, there's, like, grunt work. We also, like, set up this elaborate tent at events and take it down and get covered in dust and like but yeah we also take people out on hikes and do trail cleanups and teach people how to backpack and we have fundraisers and pint nights and a million different events and like there was a million reasons that I took eventually decided to take this job we only had 24 hours to decide since Lyle was about to negotiate his corporate job so it was definitely an intense moment of you know it's quite the fork in the road like it's quite the fork go in the professionally road. van life or <laughs> take this corporate gig and yeah. start the family route And, like, Lyle had a very non-linear educational path. And, like, coming from the Jewish side of my family, that's more, like, type A, be a doctor, a lawyer, and have the stability. It's, like, part of that, of course, I've internalized and wanted all those things. What did Woozy want? Oh, well, actually, Woozy was cool. She's cool with whatever, like, benefits my business at the end of the day. Yeah, She wants me to be a world-famous artist and all that jazz. So, Woozy was down. And I think, like... Him, you know, getting this corporate job that was a good offer and all that gave my family, the side of my family that's more traditionally or money minded, yeah. um, the peace of mind that he was going to be able to get this good corporate job. You know, I don't think six months is going to change that. Yeah. No, that seems like a once in a lifetime opportunity yes. and the corporate thing presumably will be there it will be there so he reached out to his boss and gave him the whole situation and like gave him the pitch of like why he was doing this and how this was a once in a lifetime opportunity for like his girlfriend who's a minority business owner in the outdoor space and his boss was like who would have been his boss was super chill and was like yeah like I was a ski bum after college like just hit me up when you're ready to join corporate America Mm. so it seems like that offer still stands but yeah it was an intense decision and Lyle definitely gets the props of pushing me because I was a bit nervous about how I'd run my business on the road and what it would be like but hard to say no to getting paid to van life and inspire people to get outside so I was going to ask if there was like an option for him to stay at home and do the corporate job while you went off for the six months, but is part of the reason he's there to help you run the business while you're doing the stuff? So actually the job offer, I think they were specifically seeking out a couple to do the role. And so our boss who had done the role for um, 13 years, so he did it some of the time with his ex. Um, and so they were specifically seeking out a couple. And then added with the fact that I barely know how to drive, I would not be able to do this, <laughs> especially since we're hauling a trailer on top of this van so lyle does all the all the driving i do all the social media so that's our division of labor is it just two people like the whole so there was another team um but that's there's another team being brought on Mm. to put that more simply so this is a six month tour right how many events are there oh there's a bunch i think there's at least 50 activations that we're doing 
But yeah, they range from like something like the Big Gear Show or Trail Days to stopping at mom and pop outfitters and teaching people how to backpack or going out on excursions, as well as fundraisers. And they have a bunch of nonprofits they've partnered with. Um, and then, yeah, they're sponsors of the tour, so we're also promoting their products. So we'll have, like, for example, one of the sponsors is Cuddy Sark Whiskey. So we'll have, like, tasting parties of Cuddy Sark Whiskey. Um, one of the companies is um, Avocado Mattresses, which is an organic mattress company, and they have some really nice dog beds. So we'll go to their store and teach people how to backpack with a dog. So. Hmm. Do they make human mattresses? Or? They do as well. They yeah. do as well. Is that what you have in the van? You know, that's what everyone asks. We have their pillows. We don't have um, their mattresses because with the van, it's like an accordion style mattress so that the bed can fold up. Mm. So we wouldn't be, they don't make those. And you said, did you have decision making power over what was in the van itself? Like, did you get to customize yeah, it to your so preferences? Yeah, so we did. So the van company is super awesome. They're called Van Do It. They're based outside of Kansas City. <laughs> so we flew to Kansas City once we started this job and they picked us up at the airport. We went there. We gave them an idea of like how we wanted it built out. So they have a completely modular design so everything can be moved around. I wanted a lot of storage space and drawers since I'm also running my sticker business out of there. So opted for drawers for stickers over something like a toilet, for example. Mm. Um, but we camped down for a night near Van Duet's headquarters and then we went back in and gave them any feedback, anything we want changed. Um, but yeah, they're a super awesome company. Do you get to keep the van? You know what? No, but we, Lyle and I are plotting doing our own abstract hikes tour one of these days, but yeah, we'll sure. see. We'll see. That's cool that they're open to you promoting your own business because you get to just show up at these events and then basically use it as a platform to sling stickers or at least just <laughs> make your uh, op your brand awareness. Yeah, spread. I mean, Lyle says I'm double dipping. I say I'm double working, so yeah. matter of semantics. But yeah, I mean... The role I am focused on, like, promoting the sponsors and doing the role. Um, but, yeah, of course, I have my own product placement as well that I'm sneaking in there. So it's, like, the van stacked out with my stickers. Like, Gregory's one of the sponsors, so I put, like, my Kula cloth with my design on one of the Gregory packs that's on display. And, like, yeah, our boss is definitely looking for ways that it can all be symbiotic and promote what I'm doing as well as the tour. Hmm. Uh, so this comes out July 3rd. Okay. Are there any major events after that time that our listeners should be aware of? Ooh, I'd have to pull up the schedule. Okay. Well, Let let's me... start with uh, what's the website where people can go and yeah, find the events? Yeah, it's getoutsidetour.com. Getoutsidetour.com. That, that'll be in the show notes regardless whether... Yeah, let me... I'm sure they'll love this very explicit podcast connection. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so the next events that we're doing, you said July 7th, right? July 3rd. July 3rd. Okay, so yeah, July 7th, we'll be at an outer bike event in Killington, Vermont. And then we're at the Seek the Peak event in Mount Washington. And then we got some events in New York. And then the schedule might get changed after that. So, But those are the next couple events after this podcast come out. So if you're in New England, hit me up. Sweet. Love it. I'm going to let Chance ruminate on an F. M K. Oh no, question. we're gonna. This is an easy one. Kay. This is an easy one. It's dedicated to our Chuck Norris uh, award winner, Luke. I am your father, mm -hmm. um, and I just hope it goes in the way you want, Luke. But I, you know, I can't sway this. Fuck Mary Kill, Appalachian Trail, Israel National Trail, and Pacific Crest Trail. Mm. Interesting. Well, I'm definitely marrying the Appalachian Trail. Luke's gonna be so happy. And I'm gonna fuck the Pacific Crest Trail. And I'm sorry, but I'm gonna kill the Israel <laughs> National Trail. Not enough water. Um, just to tickle Luke's fancy, why are you marrying the Appalachian Trail? Because that's my first love in all my life. There you Simple have it. as that. I want to end with this. If you had to pick one piece of art that Ooh. you're most proud of, that like you had to decorate your entire mm. house or entire mm. space with, what would you choose and why? Okay, it would be in my yoga gal design, which is a self-portrait, meditation portrait. And I think that design just flows better than any of my other designs. So I don't know, I'm just really proud of that piece. I think a lot of people resonate with it and it just feels very balanced, maybe more balanced than I ever will be or am, mm. but it represents what I would want to be. Yeah. I have one more just to tie it all back to the beginning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> have you ever had sex in a shelter? And if so, which one? <laughs> Let me think about it if I have. <laughs> do, 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 I don't do, know if do. I have, honestly. All right. 
Yeah, I don't think I have, which is surprising. Where's the? But, but were where's jobs the, given? In <laughs> where's the? Where, where's the? If you had to pick a standout spot that you've banged on trail. Mm. Oh, I need to really ruminate on this one. There's definitely, <laughs> definitely did some ballsy things on the Appalachian Trail when I was very young. But there, there was a bench. That's all I'll say. <laughs> all right, watch out for those benches. <laughs> um. Actually, I'd be remiss if we didn't go a little bit deeper because I think I asked the question and I kind of sidetracked us. But for people that aren't familiar with your art, that are listening, that are not familiar with, you know, what you do, describe your art Mm. to them because we've got it in studio and I I lack the artistic um, linguistic Mm. skills to explain it. See, that's why I paint because it's hard to describe art in words. And but yeah, I would say my art is very groovy. Some people would say it's trippy, um, very colorful. It's a surreal twist on landscapes, but try to use all the colors I can. So I have 400 different colors that I paint with. Hmm. Um, But try to, yeah, add a lot of surreal elements, whether that's like upside down fungi or oversized plants. Um, But yeah, a more surreal take. I'm I'm a big dreamer, we were talking about dreams. So I I lucid dream all the time. So I think that probably informs some of it. Hmm. And you're stranded on an island, and you can only take three colors with you. Ooh. Definitely a teal. Definitely a forest green. And maybe a red. I'll go a one vermilion, more. F- maybe. One more fuck, Mary kill. Oh, um, I do love that. Parts game. of Roy G. Biv. <laughs> What's that? Roy G. Biv. Colors of the rainbow. Oh. You, oh. She, she gets multiple this is choices. The, this is the art school part of me. The red, orange, yellow is Roy G. Yeah, yeah, she yeah, said no, what? I haven't heard that she didn't in hear a what minute. You said. Roy okay. G. Biv. I wasn't Roy expecting to hear that. I think like kinder, you learned that in kindergarten. Well, I thought that. And then in college, um, I found out that a lot of girls in the sorority didn't know the colors of the rainbow. Oh, okay. uh, wow. That was shocking for yeah. me. I'll kill yellow. Okay. Um, give me all the Roy G. Bibs. I'll... Yeah, because green's not in there, is it? That's the G. That's the G. All right. Ooh. Blue, indigo, violet is the biv. Yeah, so I'll marry blue, and I'll fuck green. Cool. Hell yeah. <laughs> um, before we wrap here, where should people go to get more? You mentioned the uh, tour website. Yeah. You're Obviously, mentioned- i got to promote my own thing. Yeah, please do. <laughs> um, so, yeah, abstracthikes.com, or my Instagram is abstract.hikes. Sweet. Well, we've been wanting to get you on here for a long time. Yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, did not disappoint. <laughs> Some fun <laughs> stories there, especially the love interest at the beginning. Uh, we'll have to do it again sometime and get Lyle on the show, too. Oh, definitely. Love to hear, hear, hear his side of the equation. He's a better storyteller than I am. Sure, so. sure. I doubt it, but okay. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for joining us. This yeah, was a blast. Yeah, thanks for having me. I think this is the first time we are rolling now. This is the first time we've ever done an interview addendum. So uh, oh, wow. history being made oh, here wow. in Backpacker Radio Studio. But I'm not sure if that's true, but I'll we can go with that. I think I think we might have done it before. Maybe. I don't remember it, but you could be right. So you mentioned <laughs> that you had a fun story about living on a commune, and this was in the context of uh, polyamory. <laughs> so that's the only All the lead in. Words. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, as we mentioned, my grandmom is a sex and love and marriage counselor. And so she gave me this book when I was 18 called Sex at Dawn, which is about the evolutionary history of monogamy um, slash not history of monogamy, since that is not the structure in which humans were in relationships for most of our history. And that book was super eye-opening, which led me to questioning monogamy in general, slash my family's not very good at monogamy. So I was like, maybe there's a better structure out there. And I was always interested in communes and cults, both scholarly, on a scholarly level and on a personal level. And so I had found this commune in Virginia, which is the oldest last standing commune from the 60s called Twin Oaks. And I decided I would go there. Actually, initially that summer, I wanted to go backpacking on the Appalachian Trail because it all goes back to the Appalachian Trail. And I couldn't find anyone that would do it with me. So at the time, I had a boyfriend. He wouldn't go with me. My brother said he'd go with me. Then he backed out. I had some friends that backed out. And my mom felt a lot better about me as a 19-year-old woman going to a commune than going and hiking on the trail alone. Hmm. So... Did she know it was a sex commune? It wasn't a sex commune. (laughs) It was just a commune where a lot of people happen to be Uh participating in polyamory. Okay. So. Yeah. 
But yeah, she had watched some of the YouTube videos of me. There was a really cute guy that worked in like the cheese area of the farm. So maybe that was what compelled me. Who knows? Uh-huh. But yeah, I, w- I took a train down there to Virginia. No one really told me who'd be picking me up, but there was a van with this older guy um, in all tie dye. And I was like, that's got to be it. And that was it. And yeah, I lived there for a couple months. And it was a very interesting sociological experience. That's how I rebrand all my strange life experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, lived there, helped harvest fruit. They they weaved hammocks there. They made tofu. Um, and yeah, a lot of people that lived there were practicing polyamory. So that was really interesting. Not something I've incorporated into my own life yet. But from a sociological level, it was interesting. But decided to switch gears and study quantitative sociology since I thought that was going to be more marketable from a career standpoint. But none of it mattered since now I'm a hiking artist. Do all communes have the same structure? Of course not, no. So, like, what are the unique characteristics of the one that you went to? So, the one I went to was very egalitarian, so there's no hierarchical pattern. But they actually had a sister commune that was, like, an anarchist commune, so less governmental structure. And then I've also spent time at a Hare Krishna eco-village commune in Peru, so they all have very different structures. Hmm. Is there like a period of arriving to the commune where they like try to put on like appearances and make things look nice versus <laughs> when they start like revealing we're all banging each other? Mm. Well, I wouldn't say everyone was banging each other. There was like someone drew me a diagram at one point of how everyone was interconnected. But no, I wouldn't say they put on appearances. Like people were pretty authentically themselves, but all the cultural norms were very reversed. So for example, like no one shaved. So for example, we had a group circle one of the first nights and they were like, it's one of those things where like, oh, step in the center of the circle. Like if you're from New England, blah, blah, blah. But it was like step in the middle of the circle. Like if you don't shave because you don't support the patriarchy. And so everything was like reversed. So it was like taboo to shave. It was taboo to wear deodorant. Um, so that's probably the only time in my life I grew out all my body hair, which was really interesting. What are some of the craziest stories <laughs> you not you didn't have to experience them yourself, but you it could have also been someone was like, yo, one time here, this happened. Mm. Like, what's something that would absolutely blow our minds? Mm. Oh, wow. I'm just putting it all out there. So, yeah, going it all goes back to Israel, too. So this was the same summer that I went on my birthright to Israel. And pretty immediately after that, I went to this commune. And so you had to work 40 hours a week. Um, when you were there and that could be doing a variety of different activities so even protesting was considered work hours or if you were sick getting better counted as work hours so a bit more of a humane system and so I had gone to a peace in the Middle East protest um, this afternoon and then they told us that there was a party slash rave at the sister anarchist commune so I went directly from the peace in the Middle East um, protest where we went to a mosque and like broke fast and had this whole almost religious experience to going straight to the commune rave where everyone's on ecstasy having orgies, which I did not participate in, um, <laughs> but it was interesting. And they had like these big pickup trucks filled of, you know, like those like different colored balls they have at like children's, what's it called? Like ball pits? Yeah, ball pits. Mm. So they had like these ball pits in the back of pickup trucks where mm. I'm pretty sure orgies were happening. Yeah. So those balls smelt interesting unique like balls yes <laughs> but it was interesting to observe from the sidelines and nice. yeah it was it was hard to get a ride back to the commune that i was supposed to be at very late at night but i got home one way or another you mentioned part of this you wanted to go perceive just because of your interest in sociology and part of it <laughs> that's you how ha- i frame everything yeah anything controversial in my life sociological experience well and then part of you also just wanted to experience it because like you were interested in it and yeah. on like a participatory participatory yeah, participant level. observation yeah but i didn't participate in the orgies yeah what's the were you close like i imagine if you're gonna go in there's gotta be a part of you that's mm. like eh, well, take an edible and say fuck it yeah, exactly <laughs> Honestly, I'm pretty I'm pretty discerning and I felt like the orgies were like too many people and they were very indiscriminate of age and all that which you know that's cool if that's your vibe but it was just like a lot of different people and like for me personally like I want to feel attracted to everyone that I'm engaging with sexually so if I was not attracted to everyone which I wasn't I'm not gonna jump in that ball pit yeah you mentioned you haven't practiced polyamory and then you said yet after you said that <laughs> sentence oh, such a can of worms. is this in the future for you 
Um, I mean, I'm an open-minded person, but, you know, it's complicated. Our society is structured around monogamy. I do believe that humans have inherently polyamorous inclinations, but that's something I'm still navigating in my life. But, you know, I'm, I'm open-minded to all life experiences, so we'll see. How does Lyle feel about it? <laughs> this is <laughs> Lyle's very open-minded as well which you know this is actually one of the initial conversations we had on the trail especially since at that time I wasn't looking to settle down I was 22 and people I dated in the past were very close-minded to this I actually almost got ditched at a brewery in California since my ex-boyfriend was so anti-polyamory and I wasn't even suggesting we'd be polyamorous I was just talking about it from a sociological perspective um, but Lyle was also very open-minded, so we'll see. Hmm. If there was one attribute of the commune life that you experienced that you could bring into your mm. own world, what would that be? I would love for my work hours to constitute just picking blueberries topless. <laughs> I'll go with that. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, this was impromptu, so yeah. I don't have anything else to add. You? Nope. Cool. Thanks for humoring yeah, us. Yeah, of course. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. To the Trek propaganda portion of today's show, I want to go with this news story. By the time you hear this, this will be old news because uh, we're a little bit ahead of schedule right now. But PCT hiker hospitalized after rattlesnake bite. A mm. Pacific Crest Trail hiker was airlifted to the hospital after being bitten by a rattlesnake north of Tehachapi, California on Friday. This is many Fridays ago. The hiker's three companions were able to relay the emergency and provide their location to the Kern County Emergency Communication Center, which promptly dispatched rescue teams to their aid. And fun fact, um, I can't verify that the person that reached out to us is actually the person that got bit by a snake, but we got someone reaching out to us saying that they were the person that got bit by a snake, asking to remain anonymous, which is a good indicator to me that that's probably the person, following up just saying that they're okay. I feel like that would be a really weird shtick to have to reach out to us. Like we're not like we're not that big I, yet. I agree. And the memo is I'm okay. But we didn't look into it. So you know, when you're relaying news, right, you right, have right, to right. verify when something's substantiated versus not. This is yes. not substantiated. But uh, the person reached out asking to remain anonymous, saying that they had a quick recovery. I'll, I'll actually read the email without um, obviously giving any name information away. <clears throat> Uh, hi, my friend. Just made me aware that the article PCT hiker hospitalized after rattlesnake bite. That was me who got bitten. Just thought I'd let you know I got lucky and had a quick recovery and was out of the hospital after a little over a day. It seems like I didn't get injected with much venom, and I'm sure the quick turnaround and competent actions from my fellow hikers and the rescue team helped. So leave it at that. Thank you to that person for letting us know, and glad that this is a story with a happy ending. And just a reminder to all of you out on these trails that shit happens, and mm. keep your head on a swivel. I'd actually love to get a follow up from the hiker to see what happened because mm -hmm. I think even if your head's on a swivel, bad shit can happen. But, anyways, you have anything for stupidest thing of the week? Hmm. I must. I'll give you. I'll give mine and okay. give you time to think of yours. Cool, this is, cool. I guess, relevant to both of you considering the message I sent you 45 minutes before the recording, uh, warning you that I was on the healing phases of an illness. Oh yes, mm. but. For Thursday night and most of Friday, I just convinced myself that it was allergies because I was on the verge of Classic. sneezing at all times. But it's very stupid because legitimately 100% of the people in my house were sick like three days prior. I just didn't want to believe that I was getting sick. So that's all I've got. I think I've been good this week, but I also could just have a very bad memory. Perhaps you're so stupid that you can't remember how stupid you are. That very well could be it. That's my life. Uh, we have a listener voicemail, and I'm going to click it. Have we done this one? I don't think so. Pardon me. I was not logged into our account. Nope. Rocked in, logged into the wrong account. Trying to say something interesting while I do this. Um, uh, it's so much pressure when you have to think of something okay, interesting. Okay, I quit a perfectly good job back in January, expecting to go for a through hike in in April, but they convinced me to stay working all the way till June. <laughs> So my through hike plans have turned into a flip flop where I will leave from Delaware Water Gap and go north until Katahdin 
and then come back to Delaware Water Gap and head south or a couple other flippy floppy things I might do. What kind of advice do you guys have? I'm thinking about things like, will the rocks in Pennsylvania ruin my shoes early out? Will I, uh, am I going to be so hot I won't even need my sleeping bag? I do have a, a sleeping bag um, uh, cover, you know, not a cover, a little slip in. Um, just trying to manage my weight. I'm an old guy, 58 years old, and uh, I've uh, been working out, but trying to avoid all the soreness and everything getting up and getting through. So I'm looking forward. That got cut off at the end there, but mm. I think we got the gist of the question. I actually really like this question. I, yes. We were not prompted for this at all, so this is on the cuff, off the cuff. My initial thought that I thought of is first at, at first when he said Delaware Water Gap um, from where he was starting, because I just guessed Harper's Ferry. Um, I think that's a good idea for June, because what my mind would think if I were to do a flip-flop is, as someone who likes to be around the social part of the hike, I wouldn't want to miss the southbound bubble if there were to be one. And I think a lot of southbounders start like June, July-ish, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, I think Is probably right? more July than June. But but if he's to start in June from Delaware Water Gap and flip back to Water Gap and go south, I feel like that's where the southbounders would be by the time he'd get there, right? Mm, Do you think that would match? It'll out? take more than a month for them to get to Delaware Water Gap. So, but it'll take him more than a month to get to Katahdin. Mm. Do you think he'll be around people for the southern part? Well, let's keep things in context. He mentioned that he's an older gentleman, not in great shape. So let's budget him, I would say, two months to get to Katahdin because he's going directly into – he's getting a little bit of an easy start in the New Jersey section. So let's first put this on the map. Delaware Water Gap is, like, right at the border of Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Mm-hmm. He mentioned the rocks, which is very astute because everyone says, like, Pennsylvania is Rocksylvania, and, like, uh, magically the rocks end when you get to New Jersey. No, there's still lots of rocks at that point. So, uh, yeah, the footing will still be somewhat tricky. Um, so let's say two months, starting in June, he'll get to Katahdin at... August. August, um, and then flip back down. Maybe, maybe Account he'll be, for some days for travel. Yeah, maybe he'll get with some of the southbounders. He'll be in that's the fe- range, that's, right? That's feasible. For me, that would be what I would want to do, because I would think the late start, the reason to then push it to a flip-flop hike would be to take advantage of the weather on the northern part when you like can, mm-hmm. right? But I would assume you also probably would be a little bit like let down about having to miss the AT experience, which largely is social. Mm-hmm. So if he were to plan it starting somewhere like non-traditional like Delaware Water Gap, he might still get the best of both. Yeah. Thinking out loud here, I haven't had a chance to think through this, obviously, off the cuff, as I mentioned. Um, but part of me would almost want to finish in Delaware Water Gap because I maybe this is just my personal bias, but I really liked Delaware Water Gap, and there's really nothing special about finishing at Springer. I guess <clears throat> if, you're, if you are finishing with other southbounders, you get that component of it. If you finish at Delaware Water Gap, you're going to be by yourself, like, guaranteed. So to Chance's point, if you're looking for the community, you have a much better chance of doing that version of the flip-flop. Yeah, if you were to start Delaware Water Gap and go to Katahdin, then flip to Springer and go to Delaware Water Gap, if you're starting from Springer in August, I don't think he'd be around too many other through hikers. No, certainly not. Um, Yeah, so maybe that's not a good idea. Uh, You could also, well, if he he had the uh, flexibility to not have to start at the start of June, maybe he'd consider a Sobo hike. If that was something that actually mattered like a ton to him. But I do think if he is like older and less in shape and concerned about like wellness, I personally wouldn't want to start at Katahdin and the Whites. Yeah, I'm guessing that his that's the reason behind his approach Mm -hmm. is to not start off with the most ass kicky part of the trail, Mm -hmm. build up some trail legs by the time you reach New Hampshire, you've got some strength behind them. So I think that's a good approach. I, he's he's right in predicting that things will be hot as hell in the mid-Atlantic in June. Mm-hmm. So um, I, this is very like new agey, uh, self-battery e. But if you've got access to a sauna, just cook yourself as much as possible and acclimate your body to being in really hot temperatures, and it'll make the 90 plus degrees and 90 percent humidity a little bit more tolerable. I think. Yeah, I'm trying to remember where I was. I know I always go off the 4th of July. I was in Hanover. 
and I know my birthday I was in NOC which is mid-March so I think it was like May late late May through probably late May I went through Shenandoah if I had to guess and it was like uncomfortable sleeping it was so hot and that could have just been our year but I mean you don't expect that for May yeah I have no idea where I was on the 4th of July, but I know I was in Daleville for trail days. So mid May, I was Northern Virginia. So uh, presumably South of there, but I remember the mid Atlantic being punishingly hot pun like, well, I guess that that is something to weigh like what, what sucks worse for you, right? Like if you are concerned about not being in great shape and the rocks and that sort of stuff, would it be more settling for you to have to not have your trail legs yet and go through rocky, somewhat steep to more steep terrain? Or would it be more settling for you to have what your discomfort of choices be heat? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question to ask yourself. I think I'd rather deal with the uncomfortable temperatures than because you can hike at odd hours i know it's harder to do when it's humid because even the overnight lows are still pretty punishing relative to being out west where like hiking at night is cold um but there's no getting past the fact that being in maine is tough as fuck there's no there's no tweaks that you can that can be done there to modify that where is the northbound bubble at the start of june i would presume a bit south of there but you'll certainly have no bows around you It'll just feel, we've had this conversation with other people that have done the flip-flop or the section hike thing, is it does feel a little bit isolating because you'll be with northbound hikers, but they're in way better shape than you are. So they'll be in and out of your life in like a half day span. Yeah. I mean, you're going to, but that's, you're going to experience that either way, because if he were to start where the northbounders start in June, they would have their legs and he wouldn't. Right. So either way, he's going to get passed by them. Yeah. Um... Yeah, maybe catching up with the Soboers is the more feasible thing because they'll be in good trail shape at that point. And they'll both have done the same part Mm -hmm. and are entering the same part at the same-ish time. Yeah. So I'm going to leave in a couple minutes. Okay. Um, Ellen, that was kind of a spastic answer, but hopefully there was at least a (laughs) shred of insight in there for you. Yeah. Okay, we're back. Chance is a little bit out of breath because she's very athletic. I'm such I'm I'm such an athlete. Yeah. I thought I was in the worst shape of I my like life. I like that. That your takeaway from this scenario is just like how I didn't know I could run like that. Yeah, run like the wind. You never know. Like you know when you don't know how fast you can run until you need to run. Yeah. Um, I ran like I needed to run. How fast do you think? So fast. Like I kept pace hour. with the van. Yeah. It was um, going minus at least a little bit. I didn't catch it, so I wasn't running faster than the van. Yeah, but van ish i was keeping equivalent distance with the van mm-hmm. all the way up this street and the other street <laughs> abstract left We're her first calling you van morrison fine should we do a segment looking through abstracts first no exactly <laughs> that, that was a joke yeah. um the stupidest thing of the week uh abstracts is that she left her purse here um my she's having too much fun most um athletic thing of the week is i saw it and i ran out to catch them and as i left the door the van was starting to pull off and i started sprinting behind it and it felt like i was in a movie people were watching me and i was like not ashamed i was proud and they got to the intersection and they turned right and i caught up a little bit when they turned and i was waving my arms like a maniac and then i turned and i at this point i just abandoned other cars in my mind and i was running in the middle of the road waving my arms while running fast and then they turned left and that leads to the highway and i wasn't signed up for that no. so i stopped yeah good. but oh she does have her phone she just messaged she'll be back here in a minute oh i sent her a message telling her that lyle needs to use his reviews <laughs> and i also told her how impressed with myself i was yeah good I'm i said it seems to be the overarching takeaway here also i almost ran as fast as your van and i am all caps so impressed with yeah. myself uh, another pat on the back for you. I went back for seconds on your did you your, uh, ginger juice. Yeah, I thought it was terrible. I'm gonna put oranges in it when there I get home. Here. I'm, uh, I'm not taking fault for that. No, it's, I'm sure it's mine. Being an old guy, they just fall out. I'm uh, such an athlete. Be there in two minutes. We'll just do the segment, and uh, she can come in and do a cameo during it. Yeah, cool. So this is the triple crown of serial killers. This is another chance inspiration. Okay, so this is funny. The pre- the preamble to this is going to be funny because you sent that, and I was like, mm, should we? And then you were like, you thought of it. And mm. this whole way here, I'm like, we can't do this because like you're not like 
still catching my breath, guys. Um, <laughs> athlete stuff. Uh, just athlete stuff. Um, but, like, you're not supposed to, like, like glamorize serial killers, right? Like, it's like when you have, like, school shootings, yeah. you're not supposed to say the killer's name. Well, you don't want to give them attention and make them, like, an idol. to this because... Um, Netflix puts out a serial killer documentary every day of the week, so... Yeah, but we can't pick our favorites. I didn't interpret that as what this segment was. I thought this was, like, behaviors that are characteristic of serial killers. Okay, so so that was what I interpreted from your message, and yeah. I was like, we cannot do this. Um, and this then was I, your suggestion. So you said that, so then I checked my list uh, of notes. Um, and you had already completed... To see how you had this idea, and I have people who might be serial killers. Which is much better than picking our favorite three serial killers each. Yeah. Because that seemed really problematic yeah. to me. I mean, I think we could get away with it because everyone knows we're just shooting the shit here. But uh, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, no. We're, this makes so much more sense because I was like, there's no way I would have been like, who's your fave? Um, <laughs> people who might be serial yeah. killers. Very different. And it'll show in our answers. I'm going to start with people who like pulp, like an orange juice Ooh. or other juices. People who like pulp. Strong disagree. That that drink you went for seconds on is triple strained. I will not have a juice yeah. pulp in my I do, beverages. I do appreciate a good juice, but also, um, like when I get OJ, I want the extra pulp. I go uh -uh. I go for the Grove stand. Ooh. Yeah. I, like, no. I want to chew my juice. You might be a serial killer. It's like people who like juice. crunchy peanut butter. Yeah, I like that, too. Yeah, okay, you are. I mean, I like too. them all. Hey, that's on my list. People who prefer chunky peanut butter. <laughs> I haven't checked this in a long time. <laughs> okay. Um, well, you get a twofer there. Yeah. My number one is people who sleep on their backs. Yeah. That's just like, if you just go and you're sleeping in the stereotypical mannequin And your way, arms aren't, like, feeling weird by it. Yeah, they're just by their sides. Like, you're basically in a coffin. That's the characteristic of somebody that's going to... Wait, and you like just sure. have your head straight up and it's not resting on it. That's like yeah. falling asleep standing. I, I go into the fetal position and have an arm behind my head and curl up on my side or I'm on my stomach. Like I turn into a weird kind of possum shape. I'm stomach. I've got arm under the pillow. That's in like a bent way. Head on pillow to the side. Opposite of the arm that's on the, under the pillow. Other arm goes up. And then the arm that's up where my nose is facing the direction of, that leg gets perched. Mm. And the other leg goes straight. And that's it all the time. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Too much stuff we stole all your money. We yeah, stole we... all your money out of your purse. Is that okay? There's no money. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not anymore there isn't. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. That's a good one. Do, do you have an issue with your hand falling asleep? Sometimes I'll wake up and my arm that's under the pillow is asleep. I think that's a thing that just gets worse with age because I would get that intermittently at your age. And now it's like every night I wake up several times to shake out my hands to get feeling back into them. I've gotten the, I have woken up once or twice for that, but it's like sporadic. It's not consistent. They have pillow mattresses now where the mattress has like a divot where the pillow spot is. And then it has two stackable pillows that go in that hole so you can yeah but i would just think like things would get stuck down there like my phone i will things. say i got a massage recently fucking the uh abstract drawing of me is very cool <sighs> i like that a lot that's n now my new favorite thing in the office yeah that was great um she could have put her hair on it coming off your head yeah yeah well, you could put your hair on it coming we'll, off we'll your have, head we'll <laughs> i don't have enough to share you although they just, skin they just skin. fall out um I got a massage recently and it was like a deep tissue massage and she did this thing where she rubbed her elbow starting at, no, at my elbow. I forget which direction she went, doesn't matter. But like I would pulse my arm from like a fist to my fingers spread and she would dig it in and it hurt so fucking bad. But for like a week after that, I didn't have any issues with my hands going numb while I fell asleep. Huh. Yeah. Well. Um, my number two... This is a callback to a previous episode and maybe one emailer in particular, but people who, or I should say just simply dry food eaters. Mm, serial killers. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You have to go back and listen to all episodes to make sense of that, but. Yeah, people who don't eat wet food. Yeah. Serial killers. Um, I'm surprised you haven't taken this one. I, I went in the order I wrote these. I should have gone in the order of most takeable. Yeah. People who wear socks to bed. You cannot mm. trust them. You cannot trust Not them. Not on my list, but I like that. Yeah. Or, like, I will couple that with people who wear long, like, it could be shirt or pants, long 
lengthy garments to bed. Like if you wear pants that go to your ankles or like shirts that go to your like wrists, yeah. it could be the middle of winter. You could be cold. I understand that. When you get in bed, figure out your blanket layering situation where you're not having to do that. What's your jammy set up? Naked or underwear. Yeah. Like, like, and I'm talking like specifically just like bottom half underwear. I'm not wearing a bra to bed. Mm. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm boxers exclusively. Well, cause I toss and turn a lot. Like I, I, I think I've said this before. I'm a little rotisserie chicken in the night or I rotate. And when you rotate in layers, they get like pulled by the part of you that's not lifting. Mm-hmm. And then you end up constricting yourself. And it's a very uncomfortable wake up when you realize that like, you like your shirts wrapped three times around your neck. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, the, if I have clothes on me, it's uncomfortable. I'm too hot. Yeah. Everything's a nightmare. I can't do it. Um, so yeah, people wear socks to bed. I am sweating right now for that <laughs> run. Oh, the adrenaline. Athletic. You get to. Um, people who drink coffee black. Mm. In that case, I'm a serial killer. But I, well, I should say I have been a serial killer. I go through phases, and I'm in the cream phase right now. I'm a creamy boy. I've tried it black. There is no way you can validate that being something that doesn't suck. The taste is objectively worse. Uh, I think the times where I was drinking black was primarily where I was like calorie counting, like borderline eating disorder. Like I didn't want the extra 40 calories to be spent on something that wasn't necessary. Okay, that's that's different. But um, the real reason I do it is I find that just pure black coffee in my stomach on an empty stomach is a little rough. Like I can have black coffee after I have breakfast, no problem. But like first thing in the morning, I need something to slow the coffee down a little bit. And I think... No, I can't validate. So I can validate the eating disorder like level stuff as having one. I can understand not wanting extra calories in the most absurd type of ways. Yeah. Um, I can also understand if it's like in a hiking context where you're on trail and you don't have access to other things. So you have to, like if it's by necessity, you get a pass. If it's like something where you're trying to like say this is your preference, I prefer it, I like it better, you're a serial killer. Yeah. Sometimes what I just really need to wake up, I did this um, shortly after the twins were born. I forget what it was. Maybe it was even coming for a podcast, but to wake up, I took a cold shower and then I immediately got out of the shower and chugged 12 ounces of black coffee just to like rip the bandaid off and wake up as fast as possible. Sometimes just you don't want anything to interfere with the caffeine. Yeah, but see, that seems like an unhealthy mannerism. That doesn't seem like you trying my, to. My caffeine it. tolerance is so high right now that like twelve ounces of coffee barely scratches me anymore. But then you could just add like three ounces of milk to that twelve ounces of coffee. Yeah, then you're chugging dairy. It just feels weird to me. Yeah, well, tomato, tomato, you're a serial yeah, killer. Apparently. Um. Okay, those were two. Um. Oh, this oh, one. Damn, that was my three. Okay, this, I have an honorable mention then. I have, I have a few. This, my last one is this is kind of a callback to our recent uh, trail days trip. Is people who don't do anything on airplanes. What, I, like just sit there with their arms crossed? Yeah, I sat next to a guy who he didn't read a book, he didn't look at his phone, he didn't watch a movie, he didn't read a magazine. Like he literally just, just sat straight. This is from Denver to Charlotte. This is a three plus hour, three and a half hour flight. You didn't rip this off an internet post because I think I saw this on like an internet post. I think this is a common one, but okay. legitimately, I wrote this on the plane with the guy sitting next to me not doing. He might have seen me write this. I'll piggyback you and add people who wear jeans on airplanes. I wear jeans on airplanes all the time. Am I just serious? What, what's wrong with jeans on an airplane? I thought a, you wear the clothes that you wear and then you're just on an airplane. No, you, you wear comfy clothes on the airplane. Well, I get like the stretchy jeans. Okay. Maybe pass there. Um, I don't know. I like, So guys have different types of jeans. Like you get baggy ones, but I just think jeans on an airplane is like you have a tight waistband. You have like just tight yeah. tightness. Jeans are not an uncomfortable article of clothing for me. Well. You must not be fat. So <laughs> well, for me, know, they squeeze that. in areas I'm, I don't like them yeah, to. I'm getting the dad bod pretty good right now. Um, yeah, no jeans on an airplane for me. Um, I'll I'll put you I'll put you in the maybe column. Okay. Well, I'm, we've already established that I am apparently because I yeah, drink. Yeah, you have a lot of blank. traits. Yeah. Um, some other ones. This is an easy one. We'll agree. People who don't like dogs. Yep. I'll give a caveat to people who've been attacked by dogs as a kid because that'll create some sort of um i'll also put a caveat for 
people who are allergic because sure. I grew up really allergic to dogs where I couldn't even pet them. And so, like, I would get to a house and I just wouldn't even be able to acknowledge the dog. And it was just easier for me that way. You like the dog, but you couldn't interact with the dog. After so many years pass, you start to just, like, be indifferent to them yeah. because you can't be anything else. Fair. Um, and that I would say is understandable and also, also able to be quickly rebounded from, yeah. as you can see me now. Um, I'll add, um, people who wake up naturally before 6am without alarms Yeah. or children screaming. Cause I know you're thinking of that caveat. I, the times I wake up early is during the summer because of sunlight. And we have blackout curtains. We have everything. But I'm talking like the people that are like up and at them at 5 a.m. Yeah. Like the Jocko Willing. Like Mims's ex used to call her. <laughs> if you're listening to this, Mims, sorry for sharing some personal details. But her ex used to call her a cannonball because mm. at 5 a.m. she used to just like shoot like a cannonball out yeah. of the bed and just like start being like can we productive. Just, can we just round up and say morning people in general? Well, there are people that force themselves to be morning people that set a bunch of alarms and like really have to try and work at it. That's not a morning person. I don't think they're serial killers. I think a morning person is somebody that is just energized in the morning mm -hmm. on their own volition. Yeah, they're, they're up to something. Yeah. And it's no good. Uh, single sneezers. Yeah. You have to sneeze multiple times. Otherwise, I can't trust you. Yeah. Um, people who don't get seasonal allergies. If you're missing that part of your genetics, like, you know, you ever see the brain scans where commonly people are missing like certain parts of their brain. Yeah. Like where empathy exists. Yeah. If you're missing this, the seasonal allergies, I would say one often could relate to the other. I wonder if you could do like a CAT scan that revealed your lack of seasonal al allergies. Mm. You could do an allergy test. Yeah. But I don't think the, the brain scan would no. reveal that part. Um, people who put the milk in before the cereal... Okay, I did that today. <laughs> well, here's why. Here's why. Here's why. Um, sometimes I like seconds in my cereal, and if I'm already working at my desk and I'm all plugged in, I got my headset on. Like, I, I don't want to go unplug, go into the kitchen. Then I've disrupted the concentration zone. So I'll bring the bag of cereal to the desk, and the milk has to stay refrigerated because it's milk. So I'll put the milk in the bowl and I'll go over to the desk and I'll put it down and then I can keep refilling cereal until yeah. I'm satisfied. I hear you and I understand, but it's still wrong. It is. Yeah. And I agree. It is wrong, but yeah. it's by necessity. Mm. It goes back to the drinking coffee, black by necessity. Fair. Caveats. My last one is uh, people who collect human hair and then put it on their wall. Us. Yeah. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> We're serial killers. Is that it? Um... Let's think for a second. No, I have to go home. No, okay, yeah, no time no, for done. thinking. <laughs> we got caught in a conversation with Abstract, and now I'm in trouble. Oh, wow, look at the time. Yeah, I got late. Sun stays out late these days. Uh, this one's too long to read. We're going to save this for the next episode. Okay. Mailbag. Um, oh, yeah, that is long. If you guys it's want, got bullet points. Yeah, if you want your mail read on the show, podcast at the trek.co, we'll read it on an episode where I'm not running late. You can do the five-star review. Yeah, better than butter. This is by Guy with Lots of Horse Facts. Love that. Um, I don't think I've learned anything from the show about backpacking other than when the urge strikes on trail, you better go dig a hole. If you hold it, you will end up being a segment on the show. I give the show five stars because without it, my life wouldn't be complete. I would have never bought truffle salt from Costco and I would have never put it on popcorn. Revolutionary. I don't know if I wrote this in like a blacked out haze, but the they do have a truffle seasoning at Costco and it's fucking amazing. It must have come up in conversation at some point. I don't know, but uh, I'm I'm definitely on the same wavelength as the guy with lots of horse facts. Mm. I'm, I'm a little disappointed he didn't include at least one yeah. horse fact, but True. fine. True. Uh, sticker code. I made a suggestion there. I accept. Okay. You want to read it? No, that's okay. You can. Okay. For today's sticker code, the phrase is flesh pile. It's a conversation that happened off of mic recording. Uh, super big thank you to our Chuck Norris Award winners on Patreon. Wait, we have a new one, so I want to get the list. So you Wait, Luke, I am your father isn't Luke, I am your father, because that's Morgan Luke. Yeah. This was Luke someone else. I know. Okay, well, there can be two. There can only be one. Fight. Um, hold on one second. You got to say interesting stuff while I do this. Um. Oh, I'm still out oh. of breath. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this is our newest one and you had a, you had a thing for it. Derek, I know how it's pronounced Coke. 
Oh, the derelict. Yeah. Well, what I have to figure out what that phrase actually was because I think I said it wrong. It was derelict, my ass. I, but I think it might have been my balls. Balls. What? But now I have to watch and see. It's the Zoolander reference. Yeah. We'll fine tune this for the actual time. Okay. Well, this is the actual um, well, derelict. You have, but you have to say it because you. Say, I say okay. the interjections. If okay. you say the first word, you have to say derelict. Well, I was pausing for, for you to say it. You can't say Derek derelict. You have to just say derelict. But his name's Derek. Right. Okay. Dara. Leak. <laughs> we'll figure this one out. <laughs> Alex and Misty with Navigators Crafting. Timothy Hahn, Austin Ford, Dane. Ish. Mike Poisel, Tracy Trigger. Bon- but no, this I don't like this order. I'm, Bonds. I'm going off of our list here. Bonds. It's not in the order it should be. Greg McDaniel, uh, Matt Sukup, Liz Seeger, Patrick Cianciallo, Brent Stenberg, Brad and Blair from 13 Adventures, Do Good Pantry, Austin McDaniel, Andrew, Christopher Marshburn. Another shout out to Christopher Marshburn because he's the one who commissioned our beautiful art from Abstract and Sawyer Products, of course. Um, you can subscribe and follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you consume podcasts. Follow us on YouTube. Yes. We're getting more activity happening. I saw we even had a few comments come out on uh, Warren's episode, which really? is the most recent episode as of this recording. And they're going up quick, too. If the podcast episode is out, chances are the YouTube is out, too. Sarah's very on top of these. Yeah. If you're the sort of person that likes to watch interviews and not listen to them, YouTube is the place. Mm-hmm. And that's it for today's show. I got to go home and uh, minimize the damage at home. So that's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for listening and happy hiking. Bye.